Chord button is hit. Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. Jim Rugg is on location, but I am uh, joined by co-host Brian Moss. We're debriefing Manga Quest 2023. Before we get into things, though, man, there are some plugs to be had. And 2023 is going to be a big year. Brian Moss is the creator of Outer Heaven. So many of you guys showed up uh, in response to a week's worth of videos we did with Brian previously and supported his Outer Heaven comic to the point where he put in a new reprint. So, Brian, is this thing available to people? Yes, sir. Okay. Definitely. How do they get it? Instagram or uh, my Etsy account. It's linked to my Instagram, Strange Things Moss. All one word. We'll put a link in the uh, description below for that. Uh, it's crypto killers season, man, for Red Room. I, I get back from Japan on a Sunday and already have my comp copies of Red Room crypto killers like waiting for me. Printed extremely well. A lot of people are showing up to support it. It's interesting how it works, man, because more people showed up for crypto killers than uh, the trigger warnings miniseries which is pretty cool because you want to be on the up and up you know you want to keep things growing murder on the dark web for fun and profit is the name of the game this is the cover to uh red room crypto killers issue number two gonna come out in june and just like watch man this is panel one you open it up man you're getting to panel two which is another splash page when that mask gets taken off and the story degrades from from that point there uh there is also forthcoming hip hop family tree omnibus 504 pages of Hip Hop Family Tree comics. It collects all 500, all pages of the uh, original four volumes of the comics work that I did, plus 140 pages of extras, lots of new art that I made specifically for this book. Going to be out in time for the holidays. Scoop it up, get it while it's hot. Thank you guys so much for your support. It keeps the lights on the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Uh, Jim, Jim Rugg has uh, Street Angel Princess of Poverty forthcoming. Companion piece to Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive. You get both of those trade paperbacks. You're going to have all the Jim Ruggs uh, Street Angel comics to date. Hulk Grand Design. Uh, Plain Janes. I have X-Men Grand Design. I have two trade paperbacks of Red Room out there. And the occasional WYSIWYG you're going to be able to find. Brian Moss. We have a week to... Uh, we had a week to relax from coming back from Manga Quest... 2023 and we are surrounded by our riches we are surrounded by our bounty and i thought i thought it would be great to take the opportunity to just debrief the trip the things that we've seen the things that we've experienced uh this was one for the books yes it was amazing two weeks an amazing two weeks it's funny because it was such an impromptu trip but you know we had to do it so here we are (laughs) (laughs) i think i think it became planned Maybe two weeks in advance of yeah. us going out there. Uh, I was kind of <laughs> been itching to go back for a, for a while. Have some family out there, man, uh, who are on kind of an impromptu vacation ourselves. And it created a situation where it made a lot of sense to go yeah. out there. So I booked that trip, made that shit happen. And it doesn't feel right if I'm out there without my comic book buddies because... Yes, I have people out there, but I ain't interested in Harajuku. Don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? <laughs> you can't you can't drop me in the greatest comic book city, country on the globe and make me go to like a hedgehog cafe. It ain't gonna happen. It's happening. It ain't, it ain't happening. Ain't. So <laughs> I had to hit my homies on the jack, B Moss. Yes, Brian sir. Moss, you got to come out, dude. It's yeah. going, it's going to be a fly one. I know you're itching to get back because I'm itching to get back. Mm-hmm. So, t- it was during, it was during Golden Week. Yes, it was, yeah. man. Yeah. Tie up your logistics. Mm-hmm. I finished Red Room. I finished Red Room lock stock and barrel, all of it. All like the copy editing, I had to get a bunch of covers done, all of it. So I had no responsibilities. And I was thinking it's like a uh, celebration at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what we talked about, if you remember from our last trip and we got the jet lag, but then we started working at 3 a.m. every day. Now you worked from uh, when you came back. 
from our first trip all the way up into this, uh, the time we left, basically, right? Seven days a week, man. Uh, the the thing about visiting Mangaka and being out amongst that level of craft and work is it reminds you, man, you ain't working hard enough. Like, right. We're not busting our ass enough. We're not taking things f- as far as can be. And it's great to have that reminder that there are people out there working fucking 10 times harder than you. Everybody right. everybody knows I went to the Qbert school and and the system for that when you go leave home and you go to Dover, New Jersey to to be a part of that, you know, we stayed in student housing which was the mansion which would have been the former school, like the school that Steve Bassett and you know Rick Veach and all those guys went to, mm-hmm. like that was yeah. where we stayed. And it was a house with 30 dudes and it was right when survivor reality television hit its apex and that's how we were living we were looking around at everybody like you're not gonna you're not gonna stick around and i did not stick around like i stayed for that one year right because my thought was all you gotta do is show me like i just need to see how to fucking age properly yeah i don't i don't need to filibuster with with you guys and do kayfabe fucking conceptual work so like right. my, my yeah, thought yeah. was show sh- let me let me witness some demonstration and then let me try to get paid like the goal became let me get paid before my peers here even fucking graduate that was the move right. like let, yeah, let, me, yeah. let me become right. a comic book pro while these dudes are still freaking sucking at joe kubert's teat and shit like that <laughs> <laughs> so going to japan was a reminder like that because mm-hmm. American comics ain't moving me. And no. and if this is an easy game to play here in the States, uh, yeah. it's nothing. It's so simple. Yeah, it's like it's like um everything's on um uh, on easy mode here. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas over there it's like uh, just generically speaking, you could get like a ten volume of something and that could just be a dud. Like that's not <laughs> even like a dub. You know what I mean? They consider that an L. And it's like, wait, this is the greatest shit I've ever seen in my life. It is so funny. Just to, yeah, so just to see the standard, it changes everything. Yeah. And it's the great reminder. So we go out there, man, to be humbled in the presence of that level of artwork. And then we and then you you grab stuff, man, as a connoisseur. Like I was joking with with Jim Rugg that there's like a new there's like a new attribute that I could put on on the business card really that that he could put on there as well as as well as you as we will demonstrate in this video but what is a connoisseur but a person that like you know travels the far lands for the finest of garments and, right. and the finest of cigars or like <laughs> the best food in the world it's like yep. we're, we're comic book connoisseurs dude Card- yeah, you go you go where it's at. Card carrying. You know? Mm-hmm. So totally. I so I got to Japan one day ahead of you. Like we thought, because it was so impromptu and so kinetic and just f- a fast paced setup and execution. Like I was a day off on on you guys from like when when I said I was going there to when I was coming back. So like mm-hmm. your trip was staggered by one day. You left a day later. And you went home a day a day later, just by yeah. sort of by accident. Mm-hmm. But like when when I land that first day, knowing that you're gonna be there the next day, like it's like you we land there and it's early, so we have a little bit of a day to fuck off, but not so much. You're not doing too too much that first day. You know, you could drop your bags. You had such a big travel, and you could do mm-hmm. like a little bit of stuff. So you sleep it off. And then the next day, go do some shit. And that's the day that you're landing and going to have just a couple of hours to chill and right. get get your sea legs. Mm-hmm. So on my second day being there is when we were really kicking it. And right. and it was a nonstop party for, for, yeah. two, for two weeks. If, if, if for context for anyone who hasn't been there yet, like when you go out like from your hotel and travel, so, like, let's say you're going to go from one area to another. It could only be 20 minutes, but you're going to be out all day. Like, <laughs> you're you're not coming back to, like, 9, 10 p.m. So, you're going to be carrying all kinds of shit with you. Mm-hmm. And so, on these manga quests, 
it goes to a different level. You know what I mean, Ed? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You 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 uh you lose you burn kilo calories when mm-hmm. you're out there, man. You get a little buffer because books are heavy, man. And right. when you see this stuff, there's so much out there that it behooves you to just scoop it up because you might not see it again or amongst all of the stimuli that you're going to see while you're out there. You're not going to remember if this was the place that you saw that one thing that one time or mm-hmm. if that was the place where you found this one thing right. that one time. We made that exactly. mistake last time, right? Like where yeah. where it's like you saw something and then you want to be frugal or like a window shopper and like make smart economic buying decisions. And then you're like, fuck, I th- you go back five days later and you're like, oh, I thought it was it's here, but there. maybe maybe it was in Akihabara. Maybe it wasn't right. there. Maybe it was in Nakano Broadway. You just don't know. Mm, so yeah. that creates a That's situation. Lame. Yeah. Yeah. And this time around, I was like a little better prepped in that sense because I was like, okay, like if I see it, and I had target things, and we'll talk about that, obviously, but it was straight up like, okay, here's a list. If I see it, I'm just going to get it. It doesn't matter the price because everything's affordable. So it was just one of those things where if you see it and it's on the list, grab it and go from there, you know? Yeah. And that's a that's a great preface to going through your stuff in a lot of ways, man, because because uh I guess you hit a big willy job. You hit a big willy lick. <laughs> yeah. Like right before the trip, man, just to make sure that you had like the holy grail fund. Put, yeah, exactly. Put yeah. Together. So before yeah, so before I came out, I was because I do everything, you know, murals and stuff. So I did like a mural job in a week just to have that money, those G's, you know, because I was like, <laughs> no, right this time. <laughs> and it was amazing to behold. Just like, that's the thing, dude. Like, I know what I'm digging for, but it's so much fun hanging out with a homie to see what right. they're digging for. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's the experience. Yeah, because I'll, I'll tell you, that's just consumerism. You know what I mean? So to be able to have that experience with you, if there's something magical about it, you know what I mean? So it's like, I think it's um, it's vital at this point. You know, it's, it's peanut butter and jelly. It's cultural, and it's and it's something that we've been a part of and participated in for for like a decade at this point. Right. You know, like I'm, exactly. I'm showing off that hip hop family tree omnibus. Like you and I were kicking it in Columbus, Ohio, the day I the days I drew. The cover mm-hmm. to volume one of Hip Hop right. Family Tree. So yeah. we're celebrating. I remember it. the length and the inking and everything. Yeah. Up, bro. Yeah. All I of that stuff. stuff I was on that day. Yeah. It's, it was crazy. So I bring that up because you're you're a Columbus, Ohio resident. And you have direct access to that Billy Ireland cartoon art library. And Ooh. it's a different animal than it was. You know, it's way more highfalutin and bougie now. But, right. But totally. when, but 10 years ago. When I was out there for that for that residency, which is where I did that cover and some of the key artwork for for the second volume of Hip Hop Family Tree, it was just the Billy Ireland was just this like little basement room at right. at that... uh, Ohio State University, mm-hmm. and the pleasure there was definitely taking my time and going through the stuff I wanted to go through and just having access to all of this. You put on the Mickey Mouse gloves. Yeah, and you could go through a bunch of fly ass artwork, but that w- that was fun for us for a time. But then I started yeah, to bring the homies in, and I mm-hmm. and I would bring you in, and just right. just sit back, fly on the wall. Let me see what Brian is trying to look at. Mm-hmm. Let me see what Jim Rugg is trying to look at. Let me see what Boy Bill Boy Shell from Copacetic Comics is trying to look at. Let me see what Ben Mara wants to mm-hmm. pull. <clears throat> the funny thing was that it was so clear that there's a Venn diagram of, <laughs> of interests because right, right. there was stuff you can pull, you could pull artwork ahead of time and, right. and, and you should pull, pull artwork ahead of time because the, the curators there, they'll have it ready and prepped so that you could fuck with it. And it'll put on like the tray, the little push cart, kind of mm-hmm. like a librarian push cart where they, you know, put the books that yep. need to be recirculated. So there was, stacks of shit that would just uh stay on the they called it the eddie p cart for three weeks man. <laughs> right right right, right. And, because that's what all of us wanted to see but then mm. b moss might choose like this basil wolverton that i didn't know was there right and jim rugg might pull he might have had the the foresight to to 
find out that there's like Steve Bissett, John Total Ben, mm-hmm. Nuke Face, two page spreads from Swamp right. Thing. And it's right. like, well, that slipped by me. That's what we do out there in Japan. I have mm-hmm. to I have my eyes set on some shit. But Brian Moss is like describe this dude like a truffle pig or something, man. Like he's got the eye, he's got the nose, the beak for for the discoveries. We've done a week's worth of videos with Brian Moss. Check this stuff out. Like several of those videos have well over 10,000 uh, viewers. Mm-hmm. And it, it that that illustrates the the, the taste levels that that Brian, yeah, yeah. that Brian Moss has, man. We looked at Jeff uh, Jeff uh, Smith trade paperback from 1984 of, that collected his bone college mm-hmm. strips paws uh that you know is called thorn back then right shit like that man the art the original artwork that you pulled and things just just a, mm-hmm. a, amazing stuff and i think that uh if you got the stacks near you we we should debrief this motherfucking trip dude hell yeah dude where should we start we start with manga uh, sure and and let me also <laughs> say that like i'm gonna i'm gonna make an admission here dude that uh so so like i did i did get there earlier there was no plan to it but because i was there a day early i'm like let me just do a quick pass <laughs> right 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 at just, just a sampling a couple of the mandarakes not quite <laughs> not going to broadway cuz like you go there that's an all day joint you know right. like cer- certainly you know you and i we brought some new people to to that so it's like getting mm-hmm. to experience it through their eyes you know we it's the Katamari Damashi ball that we're building. Right. But there's like some super rare stuff that like if it shows up, there's only gonna be one. And and like I just gotta see if it's there, because if it's there, I just gotta grab it right then. None right. of that was there. Like one of the things I'm looking for is that Tenko Bond number one of Katsuhiro Otomo, a gun report. Never seen it. Yep. But Sh- but Sean Koenji Sean, Japan Book Hunter, he's never seen it. So it's super rare, you know? Right. I did my quick little pass, but I did hold off on Nakano Broadway, knowing that you guys were coming and on your first, like, real fresh day, that mm-hmm. we would just handle that business, like, as, as, a, as a team. Right. So, so, with that in mind, man, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's knock off some, uh, some of your grails, because I was right. very excited let's and it. impressed. All right. So, first one, I guess we'll just start off crazy. Let's just start it off crazy, Ed. And actually, I'll need your help with this one since we got you going for a minute. <clears throat> Can you describe this to our viewers, what we're looking at? <laughs> we'll just start off with a banger. <laughs> Very unassuming. <laughs> well, is it? Because that face is pretty creepy. Right. That face is pretty fucking creepy. That is the yeah. self-portrait of Issy Sagawa. He is the famed serial killer well no he's not a serial killer he's the fame yeah he's the, a cannibal the infamous cannibal killer man he was a i guess an exchange student in france yeah and he he murdered and ate a, a classmate put her into some uh suitcases left her on the side of like a running trail the fucking suitcases are dripping gore and while the guy is like 10 feet away, walking away from the cases, some runner sees the cases, sees that he's the guy who left them there. They fucking tackle the dude, put him put him in prison. Uh, the French people are like, fuck this guy, man. We don't want our tax dollars to pay for this douchebag being here, man, killing our people. Fuck him, man. Send him back. Now, Issy Sagawa's dad is some kind of diplomat in Japan. You know, he's a Nepo baby. Mm-hmm. And through some weird paperwork shenanigans nonsense bullshit that dude got to be a free man he got caught red-handed right and he got to be a free man the rest of his life became like like a d-level celebrity and mm-hmm. there was a vice documentary talking about this dude I, I i became aware of him it was right after that casey anthony bitch got off of her her bullshit and there was all kinds of articles about people who got off scot-free from their shit. Now, I ain't saying, listen, she was found innocent. I ain't trying to get in trouble through my YouTube. You know what I mean? You're good, bro. You're good, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so, so whatever. But um, there was that, like, so there was that Vice documentary. Mm-hmm. And it showed little clips of the manga, you know, because he had all kinds of like a porn career and 
would would be like a guy who would be on like the Japanese version of like ho- Hollywood Squares, like that level of celebrity and shit. And it showed his manga. So like when I first went out there, like I was on a hunt for that. And I only met people who who had like their copy because it's very rare. It's less than a thousand. I think I think that um, yeah, Koenji Sean said that there's only five hundred of those. Right. And you know, I'm into that. I'm into wild shit. Could not find it for myself to purchase. But c- connecting with Japan Book Hunter and you and I shot two videos with him. We'll be putting those live right. soon. Um, that's how I got my hand on that on that book the first time through through Koenji Sean and it just so happened you know like when I did my first little lap in Japan and went to the Akihabara Mandarake I mm-hmm. saw that that was that's a that's a wall book you know that's a window book right. so I gave you the scoop on that and I feel like that might have been a quick purchase but can you explain yeah, that was the first one. <laughs> here's a Brian <laughs> explain the process of acquiring that book and the reaction yeah, of the yeah, proprietor yeah, sure. Sure, sure. So the reason I wanted Ed to explain every, everybody is because, like, uh, basically, Ed just pitched us a, um, a Red Room special issue. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I go to the, the lady, I, you know, excuse me, and usually just speak English. And I'm, like, pointing at the book, and she's like, oh, cool, yeah. Like, so she opens the cabinet, but then she looks at it, and she goes, reads the description. And she just has this face and she's just like repelled and repulsed by us. She was like, and she was just like, oh no, just and just sit it down at the counter. Like, they just wanted to get it out of her hands as fast as possible. It had to be the funniest thing that we ever seen in our lives. Then. Totally. Because, <laughs> be, because typically it's a no sell whenever, uh, you deal with these people in these stores. There's so many people running around. There's so many people trying to buy shit. The aisles are narrow. They want you to purchase your shit and get the fuck out. So there are no pleasantries and there's no real solid interaction that you ever have. So that was the closest thing. And and what the reaction was is like this girl, she sees it like it's nothing. And then she like reads it and then she like looks and she fucking looks up at us. Two giant gaijin, you know, and looks at us so nervously. Right. And it's just like, you guys buy this for? Why? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yo, I need that. So we'll continue that train with, um, we got, I got a whole stack of cargo, right? So let's just put this out. I'll, I'll try to put this as much on camera as possible. Give me one second. Yeah, it's all good, man. You could just show those front covers and it'll be all gravy. For sure. Oh, you got a stack. Oh. Like it's an eight and oh, five. Yeah. It's let me show everyone what we got, what we were working with here. So the cool thing about this is that um and most this is, of this it, And this is Shintaro Kago. Like he's yeah. getting mad fame here here in the States. Yeah, he's been blown up over the past year. They're finally printing his stuff here. And that's where I first discovered I bought one of his books in Michigan. I was like, this guy's fucking incredible. So then I go to Japan to look for more. And this is like only part of his work. Like, yeah, I think he's like super old. I think he's born in 69. And his and so we're talking about decades of work from uh, from him. Now I'll show off some of these covers. I'm gonna go through them because some of them I can't show. <laughs> <laughs> but this is probably like as close as we're gonna get to like anything. This is probably this is pretty on the weird side. This is pretty weird. So you can have and actually what I thought this book was gonna be about, it's something completely different. Um describing it, let's just say it's about a fecal matter. Yes. So I just <laughs> He he was just on his Instagram putting out a call to get artists and animators to uh, do this year's submissions to his latest Unko Film Festival. <laughs> Very scatological. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. Unko, 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 for those uh, who weren't around for uh, Manga Quest 2022, Unko is colloquialism for like poop in Japan. Mm-hmm. Totally. So we'll just go through some of these. Some of this stuff you've probably seen online. Uh, if you go to Japan, I would say out of the stack I'm showing, pick up this one because this has most of the traditional kind of art we're familiar with from him. Um, let me try to find something that's kind of 
man, like, okay, here we go. This is probably the safest we got in the book. So everything else goes downhill from here. So you guys get the idea. So good. So it's, But I would say this is the one to get everyone. If you come across this book, grab it. Um, this cover, I can't show. It's pretty crazy. This one's actually kind of funny, <laughs> even though it's like super weird. But this is kind of what the book is about. It's about violence and cannibalism and eating dogs. <laughs> so that's going to be fun. These, um, I would say if you were to get <clears throat> these books, there, there's two volumes of it. Uh, it's almost like zombie horror. So, you know, check that out. I wonder if but, that, is that super dimensional love gun? I'm not sure it's called cities and infrastructures. Okay. So that's what it's called via he on the these covers. I think those I think pages from that exact manga during COVID time mm -hmm. were showing up on eBay $250 a piece. And Very it was cool. it was th that it was early enough in in COVID where we just, you know, the world was falling apart and so right. like nobody knew if they would even have $250 to like the person who was selling them was nervous themselves right. probably yeah. and they were obviously bought but I didn't right. have the balls I didn't have the comfort to uh to do that because I didn't know if you know comics right. would exist in five months or something right and so um Ed's um alluding to something that's really cool that I uh and I actually got this from um Japanese book hunter I got it from Sean I'll show you guys now uh, what that is and it's an original wow so you guys can see this thing's definitely a beauty so what happened i was just talking to sean about the books he was like i got one of the originals i was like yo hold up wait what <laughs> so like he sent it to me obviously i purchased it but yeah so you know shout outs to sean again but access to this kind of stuff is critical over here just because, like, as a collector and, you know, as a curator, uh, this kind of stuff you cannot, like, you're not going to get in America. It's just not going to happen. So, Ed, when you told me about those pages, that just was, like, almost, like, unbelievable. I'm just like, dude, there's no way. You know what I mean? So, I'll show you guys some more of these covers. I haven't even went through all these yet because I bought so many. Um, but this one's super cute. And it's the most fucked up one out of all of them. You can imagine what's going to happen to the girl wrapped up in a blanket. <laughs> 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 Along with other school girls. But really, any of this stuff, go ahead and purchase it. Because here in America, uh, you're not going to get it. So definitely his work's out there. Take advantage of it. It's incredible. And then there's the last. Yeah, check out that one. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, it's funny. It's so deceptive. He because he's so good at drawing cute. He's so yeah, that's the, that's the crazy part. It's uh, it's unhinged. Like it's uh, <laughs> it, it catches you left field, right? It's like, yo, wait, this is incredible. And then it's like super fucked up. You're like, what am I reading? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's 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 a heck of a revelation. Uh, we did some videos with him about him on the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Uh, I think we did look through Super Dimensional Love Gun which is an English translation. Fantagraphics has put out a couple of things. I think it's called like okay. Dementia 21, something like that. And yeah. uh, we looked at the Doji, Outlaw Dojinchi that Kago did with Peach Momoko, where she oh, where? she wrote the, a story that he drew and vice versa. He wrote something that she put together. Now we're going to go. Dope. Yeah, it's super, it was super dope. Uh, now we're going to go uh, mostly through, through your collection, but just in the spirit of grabbing all that cargo, like I have those impulses also, but I didn't go cargo this time. I w I'm into uh, Suhiro Maruo, and, and we only got two books in America that he put together, Panorama Island and uh, Mr. Arashi's Freak Show, something like that. Mm -hmm. These things are from 1990. They're over $100 books at this point. Are they printed at like American... You know, like the are they printed left to right? I think they like, are because it's early enough. Yeah. It's early yeah, enough. Right. One of the questions that yeah. I have uh, about our culture of comics, where manga is concerned, is like, what were the first books to be published in the correct 
reading format, yeah. the Japanese yeah, reading format. Yeah. And and the funny thing, Dark Horse did Dark Horse the first Akira run. Were those published also from left to right? They they were published uh, American style. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so even that, and that would be considered late. That was like ninety nine two thousand. So you think they would have been hit by that? You know, you know, I mean? you know what I think it was, man. Uh, because uh, like it just it's totally customary now, right? Like that that you just retain the reading order. But right. when just before I turned pro, just before I quit my job, uh, at at this call center that I worked at. Mm-hmm there was a uh, Raijin comics and it was this new effort by this company called Gutsoon that was going to uh, do a weekly Shonen Jump style, like a weekly Japanese magazine. They got four or five cool licenses. You know, Mm -hmm. they got Fist of the Blue Sky and Backy the Grappler. Nice. And a couple other uh, City Hunter they got and they put it out on, on a weekly basis. But the way that they, one of the sales points for that was um that they were going to retain the reading order and that was huge to me you know i I got every every issue and i'm thinking that that might be the first because Mm -hmm. because they came out did their thing and viz is and and viz was like three uh like 2000 2001 maybe even 2002 it was yeah because i still had a job and and you know viz is no viz is the toughest motherfuckers like uh, they were like, "Oh, you, oh, that's cute. You're gonna put out a weekly magazine, and it's gonna be a hundred pages, and you got four yeah. four cool licenses." But they're like, you know, it's not Fist of the North Star, though. Right. Though Gutsoon did put together what they called the Master Editions, where it's like complete full color, like five mm-hmm. or six volumes of Fist of the North Star independently of this magazine. But yeah, you got Fist of the Blue Sky. That's cute. You got City Hunter. Yeah, that's cute. Uh, right. You you got Backy the Grappler. That's gorgeous. So we'll put out this one called Shonen Jump, and we're gonna serialize Sandland in it and Dragon Ball, <laughs> and introduce people to Naruto and introduce oh. people to One Piece, and right. uh, they they just fucking ate, they just ate fucking the ate the lunch of Raijin comics. And and I I subscribe to both. You know, like <clears throat> comics mm-hmm. were shitty enough at that point here in the states that you could could sustain having two. Um, magazines right. and and like the Shonen Jump was actually monthly, mm. so so it wasn't even a weekly. But Gutsoon got got its lunch yeah. handed to it. But Maruo is of the same caliber uh, of like a Kago, mm. like that Arrow Garo stuff. Where like you can't look mm. inside these books at all. The crazy shit that's that 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 goes on in here. Yeah. Very classic that's style. Like that right there. Yeah, you already know. Yeah. <laughs> That right there. <laughs> that says it all. Yeah, it's this very classic old school mm-hmm. approach. It's got noir to it. It feels like cl- a classic Hollywood kind of vibe. But yeah. then when you when you get into it, you find like there's like a story of yeah. You actually got a lot of that of his work. Actually. Yeah, I, 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 did, I picked up five I books. I, okay, I picked up five books this this run. I got another you know dozen mm-hmm. or so. But you can you can pick up fifty books of his yeah. like like at Nakano Broadway, the Kago section is right next to the Maruo section, and yeah. we could clear out the the whole thing. So you got some Maruo, huh? Is that what that yeah, is? Yeah, I, I just got the one, yeah, because of the Bowie esque looking thing, and then the Nosferatu in the cover. Yeah, so that, that yeah, I regret not getting that. Yeah, this one's nuts, man. So I was like, okay, if it has Bowie as Saint Sebastian and then Nosferatu. Yeah, you, and then it's called DDT, dude. We're going places on this. <laughs> I was like, if I'm gonna grab one, it's gonna be this one. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, you so, you, yeah. you got a goodie. Now, here's the other thing, people. Like, the money that we put out for this stuff, negligible. Don't cost anything. Yeah. Like, I actually didn't even open some of this shit because I've just been completely out of my mind this past week since I since I got home. But like this right. one, for instance, six hundred yen. And it's, it's like five, man. Yeah, yeah. It's wait. It's like, it's like a dollar. Like one hundred thirty yen is a dollar. So yeah, it's nothing, you yeah. know. And it's a full TPB, you know, got a, a complete mm-hmm. thought and idea. Because that's that's how these dudes work. Like Kago and Maruo, it's like they have these ideas and they get them out one and done. It's a story. It's not a formula. It's not a shonen manga right. that can last, 
you know, that right. decade it's of time and yeah. 200 books. And, and it's interesting you say that because a lot of times this is kind of like a, a life hack if you want to get into manga in the sense because you don't really need the words to um, convey the idea. And these are just so affordable. You can take risks with them. So I would say those are two key artists that you can enjoy. And there's tons of work from them. So yeah. it's like you're just going to always get something good for five bucks. Yes. You know? And even cheaper. Like some of these pieces I got for like down to like it would be like 248 yen. That's the lowest you'll typically see, uh, a, you know, a, pla a sticker on something, you know, besides clearance. And it's like, dude, that's like a buck and some change. You know what I mean? You, you know something that we that we slept on uh, almost completely, and it was um, my last Nakano Broadway trip that I actually didn't succumb to the white noise of it. But like, when you go to Nakano Broadway, you hit floor three, and if you hit the, there's a lot of ways to get the floor three, but if you hit those one steps, you come right up to that like big collage of pipe work and masks and shit like that to like signify yeah. this is like the storefront that has like all the major tango bond collections yeah. like that that store because there's a lot of mandarakes in nakano broadway that have different specialties from animation sales to doujinshi to um tokusatsu whatever mm -hmm. um so that joint with the collage stuff what do we do when we go there? We, we take a look at the collage shit and then you go in. Right. But before you go in, there are two walls of, of books of, right. of, of collections there that are like, the, yep. it's their clearance racks. Mm -hmm. It's three books for 220 yen. Yeah. And my last day, I'm like, you know what? Let me just look at this shit because we are, we are um, conditioned here. Like, like, you know, from the days of like us being little kids going to Toys R Us to get a new Nintendo tape, it's like, you know, if you're getting a $20 one, it's, it'll be like Qbert or like Centipede or some, right. bo some boring <laughs> shit. Right. So Don't we're conditioned here that right. the, the clearance wet rack is, is whack. And I'm here to tell you it's, that's not the case. I no, got, man. I got this for a hundred yen. Man, that's crazy. I so got that's the go Nagai. Yeah, let, uh, let, let me, you know what's happening is uh, whenever we talk, like the camera goes and you still like, let me just show the people what it is. There it is. Yeah. Violence Jack. Yeah. What is it? Tell the people. Yeah. So that's the collection. There's two volumes of that one. And that's probably the most pervasive. I would say that's probably the original if I had a guess from the original run. So to actually get that on clearance and to have it in print, you know, access to that. Because just think about America if you wanted something from the 70s like that. It's not going to be on a clearance rack nor is it going to be available. So it's like, just to have that one and done, and you just walk away with it, that's insane, Ed. I bought a, bun that, I bought a bunch of stuff off that clearance rack, man. Yeah, man, you can't go wrong. I got you um, can't, amazing you just shop off, You can just shop off the clearance rack and be Gucci and just walk away with whatever you, like, a tons of stuff. You would make out so good just off of clearance and tons of um tezuka i saw tons of tezuka on clearance yeah so you took a look at those racks yeah oh yeah definitely i didn't buy anything because you know this time around everybody i went there mainly looking for to um fill in specific parts of my collection so that was the goal yeah yeah so what else you get man all right so this one um super proud of wow there it is yeah so so Ed told me about this last time and I did and I was like I didn't think much about it. I kind of slept on it. And then this time around, I actually like started having nightmares. Ed. Like when I was back here in Columbus drawing, I was like, dude, next time I go, I have to get that fucking book. So, so, so tell the this, people what it is. Yeah, so this is Hirohiko's uh our Araki. 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 Yeah, Rocky, thank you. The guy from JoJo. This is his first book, Bow. And so this is the first Shonen Jump he was ever published in. And it's from, let's see here, 1984, in number 45. So this, and look at this cover from 1984. It still holds up really, really well. And so obviously um, it's going to be the first story. And you can just tell he came in both guns blazing. Like that is such, and that holds up really well. That's still a nice print, you know? 
Now, something like this is kind of like a historical item. It's a key book. Yes, very much. And it's actually affordable. So this is a great one if you're a fan or even if you um, want to start collecting. This is a great inspirational book to buy. Um, and Ed and I, we were talking about this in 84 around this time. It was super unique because six issues later, uh, that was the uh, publication of the first Dragon Ball. Um, <clears throat> and so, and then there was, I think, a few other books around that time, and we were discussing that I can't recall. Oh, I'm, I'm sure they're even in, in that exact volume. Uh, Fist of the North right. Star is, is doing its thing. Right. Yeah, let's show some of the other stuff. Kaniku Man. Cobra. And so, yeah, so to get all this curated just in this one issue, this key issue, is just almost um, a point of inspiration, even. You know what I mean, Ed? So, it does, you don't have to be a huge manga fan to be able to um, appreciate this. So, yeah, so hop in with something like this, you're good to go. So, yeah, this is definitely something that um, I'm going to explore. I'm actually, because I'm not familiar with um, Bao, so I'm actually going to get the book now and read it. So. Yeah, yeah, which is very cool because there were maybe six to nine uh, prestige yeah, format part, reprints mm -hmm. from, from Viz Comics in like the early 90s, I think. Yeah, yeah, they were ahead of the curve with that one. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I, yeah, so this was definitely one that Ed put me on to, so it was really cool to actually go back this time and see it because... Yo, Ed, I like looked it up. It was going through everything. It actually took me a minute to find this. Yes, so. like here's the deal. Like that, the the sort of fandom, the otaku nature of uh, of J of Japan is very fickle. Like like uh, they it there's a churn rate, and that bow issue of Shonen Jump was uh, a wall book, a key book behind the glass. The very first time I went out there and I wasn't uh, and I wasn't okay. understanding the significance be, because I saw it so much. I knew it was important and the price tag was much higher. So, like, I don't know if they just made an announcement at that time that that, you know, there's some bow thing in production or new pachinko mm -hmm. machines or it was. But it was a it was a key book front and center of like all of the stores and shit. And then when we went back last time in 2022, three years after my first trip, that book is in Gen Pop. You know, that's why you had to look through the shit be right. because it wasn't promoted. It wasn't, right. you know, it wasn't held in the highest regard, um, even though the price was still kind of the same, but it was mm -hmm. just kind of in the stacks. Mm -hmm. And that's the cool thing that um, you guys could probably take away from this is that there's a big history, like um, art history aspect to this. Because if you go there, um, in the case, we saw the first um, Naruto book and we saw the first um, uh, One Piece. Like to see those just in a case hanging out, it's like kind of wild. You know what I mean? So it's not even about the purchasing. It's like, oh, I'm actually looking at this. And you have access to it. I mean, obviously it's behind a behind a glass wall, but still, just the visibility of it and the presentation means a lot. It's it's wild that the magazines exist. Uh, it is not part of the culture to hang on to the magazines. Uh, right. You know, you 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 grab you grab your issue a show and a jump. You read it each week. You know, it's very thick. Like, mm -hmm. you, it's not infinite amount of real estate in your house in your tiny house and on, on the island of japan right so you get rid of that shit and then you buy the tanko bonds of of the stuff that you really really like mm -hmm. you know that's the that's the operating procedure so the magazines get chucked right when i when i go out there man i uh i'll grab a dozen shonen random random sh shonen jumps just because the, the the magazine it's a mystical magazine to me uh, i got my first one age eight or no, like nine or ten my dad was doing work mm -hmm. in south korea and somehow that shit got delivered to uh seoul south korea each week and uh dragon ball was the title that you could read you could read slam dunk uh you could read uh ninku was the title that you could read uh but it just blew my mind i like i 
had some idea that you read an opposite direction in Japan. Like I, but I would just wasn't prepared. So I would just stare and stare and stare. I couldn't understand why like that Ninku strip, it would be this super fat headed cartoonish character with the most elaborate backgrounds. And I couldn't believe the juxtaposition of cartoony Ooh. with such realist realism. Uh, Jojo was in there. Jojo was probably like the best looking strip uh, in, in those issues. Um, there mm-hmm. was a strip called Bakudan that had a very SNK Neo Geo type vibe to it. And we'll circle back to, to that, that idea. Yeah, yeah, we'll, totally. we'll, maybe we'll cap things off with that. But like one of the things that I do collect with Shonen Jump are the new year's uh, editions. And I was able to yeah. get, get a, get a new new year's edition of uh, Shonen Jump from 79. Ooh. And Man, uh, what's, crazy. yeah, what's great is they take the mangaka from within and put them in some kind of scenario on uh, the front cover. So here they are in like traditional kimono type garbs and shit. But I, I got ones where they're in like samurai outfits, football player outfits, uh, stormtrooper gear, and it's just it's it's real fun. No, that's awesome. I like that. What else you get? Um, so one I was surprised by, and this was once again just in a collection. You know, on a shelf like this, wrapped. And it had a price tag for like, you know, 1,500 yen, so like 13 bucks. So imagine taking like a Jim Ma food and then putting a Frank Miller Sin City vibe to it. And so the book's called Jabberwocky and it's by Masoto Hisa. Now this guy is, this thing's nuts. Um, You'll be familiar with his work. Um, He worked on a Batman anime. Um, and I haven't seen it. I didn't look it up, but I was just uh, referring back to him and researching. And so this book, um, it came out early 2000s. Let me find a few uh, good. Yeah, like check out that top panel right there. So you're getting like stuff like that. And you're getting seven, eight volumes of that, seven volumes of it. And so this thing is just like complete inspiration. This is just, if you want to like, get into something and you can actually buy these uh on amazon they're pretty affordable even though they're never translated but this stuff's just great super fast pace just fun you know so they throw in a bunch of different things zombies western uh tons of guns obviously hot chicks so yeah you can't go wrong so this one I was actually really pleasant pleasantly surprised by so would you say was was that a gamble or you knew about this book Nope, it's a gamble, definitely. And so it's just one of those things where I looked up the artist and looked up the title on, um, you know, my phone, and I was like, okay, I gotta have this. So because, like I said, the combination of the description, you know, like I said, like my food meets Sin City, you can't really go wrong with that. So, you know, I think that fits the description pretty well. That's special looking so, comics. Yeah. So this was great. So the that that was like a pleasant surprise. You know what I mean? And that was just one of those things where I was coming off of you, Ed, where you were buying like the big chunkies, you know, the uh, the stacks. There it is, man. Like we'll be showing some of this <laughs> stuff off, dude. Had to grab all of the Cobra books uh, by Butcher uh, Tarada or whatever the fuck mm-hmm. his name is, man. Uh, grabbed all the Cobras. I still got them in the in the bag too, man. Because like, even though I've been at home a week, my schedule has been so crazy, man. I haven't been able to look at at everything but this stack of there's a complete cobra in a bigger format than the tanko bond 1800 mm. yen that's great 15 dollars. Yeah. yeah that's just a, that's like history right there bro yeah so that's that's super sweet um another one that i was really impressed with that i got um ed and i were out at a we were at the modern rocket in shibuya actually and so I always try to get go get go to guy stuff, but not the traditional stuff that we that we know. Meaning, like you know, the mangas. So the, it, at this Madarake, they have like the section where there's bigger books, and so this is some sort of a special go to guy in his wild world of violence. Like, why would you not pick that up, right? So as you go through this, let me see if it's yeah, this is fun to show. So you get like a splash of a cutie honey transformation. Can't go wrong there super fire 
And then you go the other side. And you can tell the printing still holds up really well in this in this mag. So you're getting gold with this book. Um, and I haven't been able to figure it out, but I think this might be exclusive to this book because I haven't seen this manga anywhere else. And I'm going to set it up for you guys. So we got... And it's typical Gona guy. It's going to be... So this lady sacrifices herself in order to bring a demon alive. <laughs> and then they attack Earth for some weird, odd reason. But, you know. But this book, once again, a couple of bucks. You can't go wrong. You're going to always get something cool. Ed and I were breaking down this page. And you can kind of see down there those cars, like those crappy swipes. It's like the same car, but just a little bit of a variation each time. So you can see some of it's phoned in, but overall, you're still getting a really high quality Go Nagai story. Yeah, like like Go Nagai is special because when you when you look at an individual page, it's it's pretty fast stuff. But the gestalt of the thing, the whole story is that that that's the that's where that's the magic, you know. Uh, right. So. That's just that's how Gona Guy rocks. He's figured out the shorthand. He's figured out the way to get to do seventeen pages a week with minimal assistance and all mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, because a lot of times what he's doing, um, he's not using too much uh any deleters or zipatone. It's mostly just a brush pen, and that's what always attracted me to his work. Actually, Ed was just that visceral brush work because it's something that is more relatable internationally versus like. You know, when you're a kid and you see a zip a tone or like a deleter, you're like, man, what is that? I'm supposed to draw dots on it? You, know I mean? you have no clue. Yeah, totally. <laughs> how do you measure? Yeah. How do you measure out the dots? <laughs> right. They're so perfect. Yeah, some stupid shit like that. Um, but you can see, like I said, the quality of this mag is on a different level. Like he actually put in a lot of work on these pages. So seeing some of this stuff is undeniable. Seeing stuff like that, that page and, and some of the others uh i have to say i have to imagine that kaze shinobu one of his prized you know uh kohais had to have a hand mm -hmm. in that i i would i would bet anything man because the <laughs> oh, symmetry yeah, is there totally, yeah the, totally, the, the color yeah. is there yeah totally yeah go the guy's not gonna sit there and do all that so yeah then you get some of zinger so yeah so this book is a, a really great one to pick up that i found so that was definitely a a heavy hitter. That was a, that, that was a good one, man. Because we we uh, were at Mandarake just before it closed. Like like we did a big tour that day, and like you're jet lagged, you're sleepy, you're fucking dehydrated, you're weak from carrying so much stuff. But if it's possible to still get a little more in, right? We do that. And yeah. and you and I like we had fallen soldiers, you know what I'm saying? Like like uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like we had a posse, <laughs> we had a posse, and then you know this one will fall off, that one will fall yeah. off, and then the last two left are the real yeah. students of the game, yeah. and we gotta go off and get one more lick in, yeah. And we're there, you know, 15 minutes before Mondaraki closes up. I'm coming out with um. Actually, I think this is that's when I got the Cobra. Actually, like, the Cobras, like yeah, yeah. yeah, I got the Cobra, and I got about a half yeah, dozen cool. showed yeah, showed had jumps. Full bags at that point, Ed. We already had full bags. Yeah, you know? yeah, and I, and then and then uh, we busted that magazine that you just showed everybody. We busted that out at that Starbucks um, mm -hmm. above the Shibuya Crossing, where you could like watch the, the scramble, and we yeah. were just fucking chilling with some hot chocolates. Going, yep. th going through manga, the, like the day's manga stuff. And yeah. that's when like the freaks were coming out at night because there were those like neon cars and like Tokyo drift cars and shit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And yeah, it's like, yeah. oh man, the Yakuza is out right now. Yeah, yeah. It's great because it's one of those things where like having those kind of moments is actually like the kind of like the perk of the trip because like in America, I don't know where everybody lives, but just in general, there's not much publication going on. There's not arcades. So just to be able to have that idea of like, you know, we're going to go to the comic book shop. You could literally take five bucks. Like we're going to go comic book shop, get a fucking dope comic. And then we're going to go to the arcade and they're going to go have a drink. You know, it was like 
you can't do that like that doesn't exist you know what i mean like on that level for you know? yeah for two so, weeks man like like yeah. uh, you know we go to our retro game floor at the gigo building number three and mm-hmm. uh, akihabara put in a day of very intense arcade gaming from classics yep. and shit like mario brothers and centipede and and uh, space invaders to like yep. the more elaborate typing of the dead and <laughs> right, games right, like right. this and then go get some fucking comics and then get a showa era melon soda with the with the fucking ice cream at the top hell yeah watch rinse repeat and live that yep. live that shit dude and get some conveyor belt sushi like all of that yep. shit in a day and then and yep. then do like one big event you know like go see one cool art show go see you know like this this event go to this museum whatever but then is there a book off in town? Like, <laughs> right. is, is there a book yeah, yeah. off in this section of town? Right, exactly. And then because it's of a- Golden Week, there was so much fucking food. So, like, wherever we were at, you go do a museum thing. And then upon exiting, there's a million tents everywhere that have, like, mm. a $300 yen foods, man. So it's like, you go to this festival, spend, like, $20 and get, like, seven or eight different things that you never ate before right exactly it it was a special trip Mm -hmm, definitely um and speaking of the gallery at um going to exhibitions um and we'll get back to what we uh bought and everything but this uh show the amano show uh the creator uh well the the character designer for final fantasy uh he had an art show yeah and so our boy john he took us he was like yo let's go do this and so the first week we were slammed we were just like out and then just, you know, getting all of our shit. And so it took us a week to go see an Amano show, which is crazy because, like, if that was here in the Midwest, Ed, we would be there day one. But that's, like, how crazy it was, like, doing shit in Japan. So this was the art collection from the exhibition. Now, something I realized is that Amano always has an art show in Japan going on. I think he has some sort of hustle he's working where it's like he sells like these really high end prints of his collections or or piece of a, of his work cuz um but i mean it's still cool but this so this is the catalog we got from the exhibition uh the exhibition included work of what was it Ed? final fantasy vampire hunter d um a lot of the, all the final fantasy stuff through 1 through 6 obviously those were heavy hitters but then they had some of the newer stuff there too like from uh, 9, 10, 11, 12. I don't know if he worked on 12, but I think there was art from 12 also. And yeah. so with this art and with this art book, uh, it's pretty thick. Um, still, this is new, so you can get it at a good price. The quality of the prints are amazing, actually, in this. And this is, I would say this is a legit catalog to show you the expansion of his work and the quality of the work. Like, you can't really go wrong with this book. You yeah, know that's, I mean? that's going to be an episode of Kayfabe for sure. Yeah, and, definitely. And, uh, you know, I haven't even really busted that book out yet and, and, right. and took a good look inside yet. But uh, mm-hmm. the we've, we, we've been to two Amano shows uh, in, in our last two trips there. And, right. you know, like with the more new stuff that he puts out there for us to, you know, to, like to exhibit – it's like sketch work, even, even in a painted form, you know, like it's kind of like right. very raw, you know, it's not like what you think. If, if a person saw it, they wouldn't see the Amano in it, but right. the, let's paint a picture of this like little show that we went to because it felt like we were the only art minded people in right. the joint. There were all these chairs and easels in the middle with, and, constant flow of like salesmen there yeah. to see what you're about and what you're trying to buy. Yeah. They were interrogating our boy, Sean. They were like, Oh, what do they do? Cause he's like, Oh, they're artists. And you know, and so it was one of those things. It was kind of funny to that. They were trying to gauge us to see like what we were like about or whatever. The, the, and it's what... just like, it was kind of like weird actually. And I would say, because it's like, um, they were here to see art. Like we're not like here to like don't don't like sniff our wallets. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like no. That. They they saw they saw dollar signs in the eyes because we were so fly, you know. And, right. And uh, <laughs> and they were hustling people, 
because um it was just like G Clay Prince. Right. And, yeah. And uh it was like two originals there and they were like super small pieces and like the posse where we were with some people didn't even like the pieces you know what I mean <laughs> some people, they didn't like the original I was like man are we here I was spoiled by Columbus though Ed you know with the cartoon library so I was like man where's all the originals you know well yeah and and, and like with the G Clays um, because it's just you know he Amano it's not a he don't care about artists coming to check his shit out. Like it was the G clay prints that are $5,000, $6,000. And mm-hmm. it will be like the artwork for the packaging on final fantasy one, you know, the dude with the swords and, and right, exactly. all of yeah. that shit. And you and I know that like these lines on this piece, these are pencil lines, but like right. on their G clay treatment, they make them like a metallic silver. Oh, oh God. And then they yeah. put that like topographic jizz on it. Yeah. So it just looks like, like a, a line of mercury. Thing. Yeah. You had all this weird aliasing on the pieces. I was like, or they put embossed it gold leaf. Exactly. And I'm like, like, stop. I'm like, just <laughs> leave it alone. Like the artwork speaks for itself. Just make a print, my guy. That's all we need is a print. And, and that's the thing because it like, it's just for salesmen like that that whole experience was a mono stack in paper yeah yeah that's why i said it kind of like let me kind of it kind of exposed a mono's real kind of racket that he's running you know what i mean like because in the art world it's just kind of like ah eh, you kind of avoid that you know what i mean and so it's like you want your work to have prestige and obviously his work does but there's a difference between those cliche prints and then the originals. You know what I mean? A big difference. And and I think like as as artists, like we we didn't get any answers from from the work because, like that Final Fantasy one label art cover art, right? That shit might be like three times the size that he drew it, right? You know exactly. what I'm saying? So like you you just. You get no information. That, it was so cool to see, but there was a disappointing component because it was all kayfabe shit, you know, yeah. blown up extra with. Yeah. It, it's it, And there's there was shit done to the artwork also that was like gourmet. Like, like you mm-hmm. know how there are these um, restaurants that pop up that might have like a grilled cheese sandwich or that might, but, and that might be the whole thing. But like they squirt a little truffle oil on it and then they get this to charge twenty five dollars for for the right. the fucking melted cheese sandwich, like right. there was so much of that where like they would take yeah his because artwork. some of the framing the and the framing it was garish you had like a a triple mat fucking framed pieces and shit like that I'm like dude what is this crap all over the art you know what I mean yeah yeah and 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 you know the direct opposite. Would have been the uh, the Tarada, the Katsuya Tarada art show that like I'm so bummed that you know we kicked it so much out there, mm-hmm. but obviously you were there with people, I was there with people, so like we had to we had to make time with others and shit. Yeah. Um. But like those pieces looked incredible, and it was the lack of pretense that was amazing. You could take pictures all you want in in uh, the Tarada art show. Um. There's thirty forty pieces, all original. Uh he mats them on corrugated cardboard and it mats the corrugated cardboard onto a piece of block of wood. And I thought that that was such a punk rock tasteful Mm -hmm. approach. He'll draw a little extra on the corrugated cardboard. Nice. Uh, He would put like, get a piece of uh, a masonite or something, uh, put gesso all over it, or maybe just even like a white paint and then Mm -hmm. allow those like liberal paint strokes with all the, all the visible brush strokes in there he would draw over top of that and like exploit that texture and know mm-hmm. how to with a very blunt soft pencil figure out how to um get a metal texture on something metal and get mm-hmm. a denim vibe on something uh, yeah. have shit feel like corduroy like he, cool. exceptional exceptional artist and supremely humbled by going through that i picked up a, a tarada sketchbook while oh, cool. uh there and and that will be a kayfabe episode for sure yeah totally yeah so um i always try to get the uh kazuo kamimura work 
uh, the guy who did uh, Lady Snowblood. Yes. So last time I got like a huge stack of his work, no different than the Kago uh, this time. These were really interesting. So we were at the Madarake, the one Edwards, the stacked levels, the 8-4 stacked. Yeah, that's Akihabara. Yep. And so the one in Akihabara. So there, they they were sealed once again, and you could just see the cover from the one side. I was like, okay, yeah, we know what this is. So it's called the 60, centi- the 60 centimeter woman. And so the interesting thing about this stuff is, um, well, one, check out these covers. Super psychedelic. Super fun. Um, now, it's co- almost a, well, I would say it is a comedy, which most of his work is like serious overtone, um, usually has to do with corruption of the government. And then Lady Snowblood comes in or whatever female samurai he decides to draw and, you know, saves the day. But you're getting stuff like this in this book. So you're getting a lot of cool fashion. Uh, this was made in the late 60s, early 70s, I think, I recall. Um, but yeah, the rest of the work is traditional, what we know of him. Um, but yeah, it just has a different slant to it. A lot of um, spaced out panels like this. So I think this was a really good collection. So I'm really happy with this. And I actually might try to find a way to translate it, you know, through Google or something like that. Because it would be kind of, it looks like a fun read. Yeah. So this one I'm, I'm really happy with. Um, the company was published here was called Action Comic, which is kind of funny. So I'm curious to learn more about this company if they're publishing stuff like this. So we might be onto something with this collection. I think I think Action Comic was uh, the original Lone Wolf and Cub. Even I seem to remember that oh, that logo on the spine. So like maybe they dealt oh, okay. with that gut '70s kind of kind of vibe or some shit like that. Man, yeah. I went to uh, Uncle Emily once, 2016. And the Lady Snowblood dude was like the president of Angoulême that year. They they elect a, like a pre a president, and then they do a big old art show uh, mm. at like the main museum with all their work and show a bunch of originals. I got to sit, I never knew that dude's work uh, before that man, and went mm. to hit the art show with his stuff, and was just fucking mind blown. Like those covers that you showed off where it would have like that faded airbrush background with like the characters yeah. like that, that shit is all on the page. Like that is yeah, all man, on the original is... art. The dude is fucking a ruler. Yeah. He's a beast. I got hit to him because they published the, uh, um, uh, was it? Kill Bill came out. Yeah. So they published the, uh, lady snow blood to have the kill bill design. And then you can't find those now. The super rare. I have them from when they first came out, got them used super cheap. But just a fan ever since. And I was like, if I ever go to Japan, I'm just going to buy all his shit. And so it's like just cool to have something that's like way off the beaten path of his traditional work. You know what I mean? So, yeah, this is definitely uh, something to keep an eye out for. So, dude, when we were out there, man, we we uh, the reason why it took us so long to go to the Omano show is because there were like three big things that happened all at once, like one day after the other. It was like Super City Comic Con at Tokyo Big Site. I went to that one myself. Mm-hmm. And it was me and all chicks, all girls, man. And that that was like f- super far out. Because like that wasn't, as far as I knew, that wasn't really like sold like that, you know? But it was just, mm-hmm. it was that level of stuff. And... It was even bigger than the Cometia show that we went to, but mm. but it was like less interesting stuff because it was all assimilation. Like everybody was doing shit that looked like each other, kind of. Right. Yeah. That's what you. That's the problem that you'll run into. Yeah. Right. Then and so, the day after yeah. that, there was another like thing that is slipping my mind at the moment that we all that we all did. Um. And then the day after that was Comitia. And we did that shit, man. What are you yeah. showing off right there? Yeah, so this is the program guide. Now, I wish Amer- the American con- conventions can really take a tip from this. So it was so efficient. So we're talking 3,500? 1,000. Pu- 35, Jesus Christ. 35,000. <laughs> 
<laughs> tabling artist. And the, you get this program, you pay for it, 15 bucks, something like that, 15, 16 bucks. Then inside of it, it has this right here. Now attached to this is going to be the ticket that you give them to enter. So imagine getting um, every underground comic book fan into a convention with no with no issues. That's basically what we experience. Now, on the floor, imagine whatever major city you live in, convention center, take that entire floor and make it tight aisles that are about, what would you say, Ed? About six feet apart. And that's what you walk through side to side. And no matter where you look, it's a new doujinshi or some doujinshi artist or somebody with recipe books or food reviews. And it's just nonstop. Now take that one aisle and times it by uh, a mile. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and my dude, we were in one room of four. <laughs> we did not make it through in a no, whole no. day we spent a whole day there and we made it three quarters of one room a four room you know there's four rooms yeah. total like yeah. we we did not see 20 20 percent we didn't see 25 percent of, of the of, yeah. of the experience i spent my money that day that i had allocated just on that part like that's how easy it is and the stuff's cheap once again but it's literally like any way you turn there's something amazing now there's also going to be disturbing things <laughs> <laughs> see i'll see, let you leave that conversation and if you want to go there <laughs> well, well like i <laughs> did a previous video man uh the video is called something like the greatest comic convention in the world is not in america and yeah, it, it was it was Comitia November. Like that's the that's the other thing, dude. This fucking convention happens two times a year. And what is crazier is that Comitia was smaller than the one I was at at the same venue two days prior. It was smaller than that. Insane. Which is just unbelievable. The advantage of the first one, the Super City Pro Comic Festival, whatever it was called, was because it was all chicks. Mm -hmm. Um the fucking lines out the door to the bathroom were everywhere for the girls and like i could always uh, nice. i could always hit, hit hit the head in two seconds but yeah when i did comitia the first time we did that video i showed i told jimmy about it showed off my bounty from there um mm -hmm. and i got a bunch of good stuff there for sure uh i was nice. talk, i was talking about how the culture of comitia is like if you you know you bring your shit you gotta everybody uses the damn um train so like people are bringing maybe a couple of boxes of stuff inside of like a pool luggage, like a, like a pool mm -hmm. cart luggage. And that yeah. includes their, um, tablecloths. Everybody got a fly tablecloth. Everybody got a fly setup. Um, nice. but you ain't bringing 500 of something, you know, you, you're bringing right. maybe like a hundred books. Right. Exactly. And cause, it's, Cause it's all little girls also who, who, who are pulling these carts and shit. Right. To and, give you guys an idea of like um, of the amount of people that were tabling, this middle section is just the um, index of the people tabling. <laughs> it's an A to Z, uh, like, and then I'll show you. Let me find a safe page. And so the pages are this dense. Yeah. Like, so half of this catalog is your vendor. It's just telling you where the vendors are. Because it's so dense there that, like, you'll see people walk around with, like, clipboards, like, and referring back to the guide of where they need to go meet their favorite manga kai. Like, it's crazy, yeah. you know? And and last time I went out there, uh, because they don't have so many comics to sell or whatever, when they sell out, they take their tablecloth down, they put their chair on top of the table... And it's done. That's a wrap. They're 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 done. Maybe they're taking whatever money they made and they're going to buy some manga for for themselves or something. And right. and the first time I went out there, there was a whole section uh, that was um the hentai shit, the porno shit, and that mm -hmm. was all gone. Like like 
because I started at one end, I started at the safer end the first time, going right. there the whole day, you know, you could corroborate. We spent the day there. You know, right. we spent six, seven hours there. Um, but by the time I w- made it, you know, an hour five or six to like where the hentai is, because they push that shit at the furthest end, it was right. just a wasteland. And there might be like a dude or two set up all along People the way um, yeah. who just ha- didn't sell out all their shit yet. So right. the thought this time was like, well, let's start at that end. Like right, if, if that's yeah, if that's the shit that goes first, well, let's mm-hmm. start there. And we did. And I think it was Hakim who said, "I need to take a forget me not pill after yeah. after seeing some of that <laughs> stuff, man." Yeah, no, it's only. And um, all that being said, you probably think like that because the hentai is such like a big thing that there's not like you know, that that dominates, and it does. But that being said, there's still a lot of great stuff. So, like, um, I found this one. Uh, it's called Occult, Occultic Yellow. Um, and, it's and like, really what's cool about this is the printing and the quality of the book. So it has, like, a little bit of an art flair to it. Um, it's nothing too extreme, pretty straightforward. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that once you're there, you just want to pick it up. Um, because you won't see it ever again. Once again, like this stuff gets printed and that's it, you know? Um, Let's see here. This one. Okay. I think you got this one too, Ed. Uh, Maybe. Uh, This is like, so an artist where a lot, a lot of the books you'll find that are like tame are going to be like character design books. And so this one is kind of like a lo-fi. Let me find a okay page to show. So yeah, so this you get like a, a low grade aliasing kind of style character designs. So yeah, stuff like this you'll see for days. Super cool, you know. So this stuff is just jazz. So a lot of that. Uh, let's see here. This one was a great one. I really like this one. Has like a European style to it a little bit, um, but you can see the quality. Now there's um, and Ed, you can. Um, because you told me about this, but I'll start the conversation about it. Uh, there's printers there that just print Gojinchi. And there's like, I think you, there's like four or five of them. But the quality, the funny thing is the quality is better than American printing. <laughs> and this would be considered just their like indies and underground stuff, right? So you're getting a really like nice quality book for like five bucks. And this stuff they have there all day. So, yeah, it's really cool. Ed, you want to add anything about that? Uh, it's inter- Isn't it interesting how that festival, it's an all-encompassing ecosystem for comics making. So, yes, the, the publishers, there, there, are, there are legit print factories that only do doujinshi because the culture is so gigantic there. So, like, they keep those presses running. 24 7 on the strength of doujinshi and they have a lot of bells and whistles to attract enterprising mangaka like almost every cover can do some kind of like holographic image that Mm, is something that that, yeah yeah that we that we like put premiums on in like the 90s oh look it's it's got a shiny hologram like every comic had a hologram uh die cuts like you said there was that one it's like the shape of a coffin um that sort Mm. of thing we were on such a small section of that festival because we stopped a lot and and looked at a bunch of stuff. And I would say that we bought every interesting thing that we saw that was that was just like deviated from the norm even slightly because yeah. there was still a lot of uh, assimilation amongst the Comitia people. There is like a state of the art and a lot of people like use those state of the art techniques and a lot of that is like a tracing kind of thing or like these yeah, like you know, I, yeah mm-hmm. these little like, that thing. yeah so you know stuff like you're what you're showing off you know that's the shit that's uh, just it's uh, different enough to like really mm-hmm. ca- capture capture your eye yeah and it was crazy because they even had um the art suppliers there and the um uh, Wacom company was there. So it's actually like legit. Like if you're going to have Wacom there as like your Cintiqs and all that kind of crap, 
it's like you're doing something right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, there was like two or three art um, art supply vendors there also. Um, that was really cool. Um, really affordable stuff that way. But yeah, that convention kind of, um, because I didn't get to go to the last one, it kind of set the bar, the new standard. You know what I mean? So it definitely has the, if you make it to Japan, base your, uh, your trip around um, one of those conventions. You can't go wrong. Yeah, you picked up some supplies. Yeah, I don't have it with me, but um, I picked up a watercolor set. Um, it was exclusive to like some previous exhibition or some show and they had like one or two left and it was like, oh, I think it was on sale, but we're talking, it's, um, it has the cakes in it. If anyone knows about watercolor, they come in little trays, they're called cakes and it had 160 cakes and it was like, um, a dollar per cake. So it was like 160 bucks for the entire thing. And we're talking like the highest standard of like watercolors. So yeah, that was really slick. Um, that was enjoyable. And then obviously they had tons of art supply there as well. So it's a one-stop shop. Yeah, man. Uh, we lived through an earthquake out there. That's right. We did. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain what, what, what that was like for you? <laughs> yeah. Because cause I'm going to uh, like, I'll tell the people right now, like for me, I was on my, my room. We all got our own rooms, you know, cause like it was, we stayed at these super cheap hotels that are like for businessmen and and they're not meant to be there for that long. It's like you come into Tokyo and you fucking do your meeting. You have a place to sleep and then you dip. But like we just like use the cheapness of that room to our advantage because it's not like we're going to be at the room but to sleep. So right. fuck it, you know. And and my little room was on the second floor. So it was very stable. And the only reason I even knew there was an earthquake was because the next day I look at my phone and you were like screen capping like Richter scale shit, like warnings, right. like, 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 see, I turn off that Megan's law shit or, or, uh, Amber alerts or whatever the fuck on my right. phone because mm -hmm. there must be heathens in Pittsburgh or something, man. Cause that shit was going off all the time. And I'm like, fuck this, man. I just don't, don't want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. You don't get too many Amber, Amber alerts here in Columbus. But yeah, so what happened? We're on the eighth floor, and this is already a liability, Ed, because in our hotel, I don't know what the fuck was going on, but there were nets. Like, okay, so I'm going to try to describe this, everybody. Imagine your building as, if you're looking at it from above, it's the number eight. So you're going to have two holes that go down the entire, <clears throat> like, hotel le levels, every level. And so it's raining inside the building but it's outside if yeah. that makes sense okay so we're on the eighth floor and on the and then so i'm still jet lagged and i'm awake and it's like four in the morning and it says my phone alerts me it says earthquake and i've never been in earthquake i live in columbus ohio i don't live in la and so i was like i woke up uh, my partner i woke up rachel and she goes and I said, have you been in an earthquake before? She was like, yeah. I said, hey, are we going to die? <laughs> like, this, this is something we should be worried about. And so uh, it was like not considered a big one. So I ended up like my jet lag finally like wore off and I fell asleep. But so I technically slept through it. But Ed, what was your experience like? Did you sleep through it or? Completely. But but like I said, I was I was on the floor two. And, yeah. and I didn't even shake or nothing. Like, did, did, were you up for a, the shake of it or no. anything? No, not anything. I think Ra Rachel recalled it, though. So yeah. so my people um, were floor 12 and <laughs> spoke with hyperbole about the building this like this and stuff and, <laughs> and getting under the bed and things. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's funny. So, like, combine that with the nets. I'm like, man, where the hell am I? I yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> is this the gateway to hell yeah man. so yeah it was like one of those things where i like had moments of doubts on the trip where i was like i was like is this is this am i gonna survive this so yeah so that was pretty funny but it was cool i actually don't mind the experience of it because i'm safe you know what i mean but like yeah that's definitely a notch on the belt at this point <laughs> i was in a typhoon the first time i went to uh, tokyo Ooh. and uh the thing that scared me the most was like 
all all the all your friends who live there and shit they i think it might even just be cultural that it's like they're extra cautious so these dudes were hyping me up and freaking me the fuck out you know and they're like and they're like you know get three days worth of food and yada yada and i'm just like what the fuck am i doing here like you know my thoughts were like oh man i Ain't nothing for free, man. Now I gotta. Now I'm gonna <laughs> right, right. die. Like, like I, I think I'm a big willy, and right. I get this fr- big free trip, business class tickets, all this shit, and and I'm just gonna die. Like, <laughs> right, die. because <laughs> also like there was a uh, construction site right outside of my window, like right across the street from the hotel, and I just looked out my window and just like spied all these like long loose. R- metal rods and shit that were like kind of like oh, had a rubber shit. band around them and shit uh, yeah and i'm like wild. well those things are javelining right through my window and gonna fucking pierce me and just like stick me to the fucking wall like that's that's how i'm gonna be discovered and shit is just like these darts flew through my chest <laughs> right, right. and i'm stuck against the wall and <laughs> the typhoon comes happens and what's what are you supposed to not do you go by the window so like i'm like looking in the wind through the window just to like see what might be happening outside right and there were like these flags that were on everybody like all the businesses and stuff like all that shit goes away like that shit just flies the fuck away um the metal rods were not there like they either got secured Mm -hmm. by somebody or they fucking flew away yeah and crazy shit happened but uh, the very next day, I remember going to uh, Nakano Broadway and like when leaving the hotel, you wouldn't even know that it even rained the day before. Like, wow, it was back to normal. Yeah, it was it was muggy because all the um, it was still hot out, you know, like so like all the moisture, all the precipitation just like evaporated and was in the atmosphere. But there wasn't even right. really puddles, you know. Wow. And with this uh, earthquake. It was nothing to me, man. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was it wasn't shit. Like I like I totally fully slept through it, but everybody else uh, had, ha- had their had their story, you know. And I'm like, fuck. Yeah. I, I'm like, man, mm-hmm. I'm 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 toast. Like, if there's like some <laughs> emergency at night, when when I when I just hit the sack, <laughs> I'm done, dude. Like like I am going to. It's gonna be that unfortunate, like in Sandman comics when when like death comes by. And like the right. little, and the little baby's like, "What? That's all I get? Like, <laughs> no, no ceremony, nothing, man. Just go to sleep and then, right, get exactly. get, your, get your ticket punched." Yeah, 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 totally. So yeah, that was kind of funny though because it was one of those things where I was like, "Man, this can't be happening." But then, like I said, after the fact, I was like, "Okay, like I got the notch in the belt. I've been through an earthquake now. <laughs> it's not too bad. I slept through it. I'm a big boy." So, yeah. So, that was pretty funny. What's some other stuff you got, man? Yeah, let's see here. So, I did buy a brick. Um, I got the Video Girl AI. If you guys remember this series, this used to be in the Viz books, uh, too. Also, Ed, do you remember these from back in the day? I do not, no. This would be a Shadow Lady, if you remember Shadow Lady. Uh, that was another uh, manga. It's created by Mass. Uh, Kusa, Keizu, Katsurai. Um, so this stuff's really good. Um, it was in Shonen Jump. Oh, let me make sure the page is cool. So yeah, so this was one I've always wanted. And to get this for like super cheap, um, once again, it was uh, probably around 20 bucks for everything. And it is how many volumes? We got 16, 15 volumes of this. So this was a great one I picked up. So super proud of that. I'm going to get into that. Because like I said, a lot of this stuff, you don't even have access to in America or able to read it. So it's like, well, now I at least can look at it. Um, another one I got was this oversized Mazinger. Um, surprisingly, I don't have much Mazinger. This, the price tag still on it, Ed, 350 yen. <laughs> so <laughs> insane. So this one will show you the quality of the printing. You can't go wrong, once again, go the guy. Um, this is one of those things where I kind of bought it on a whim and have no regrets. Look at that killer page. That's great. And then um, I gifted last time my Otomo uh, storyboards. 
So I picked those back up. And then the new one just came out, the Animation and Keyframes Volume 2. So that's hopefully on the way soon. Did, did, you, you, order, get your, did you order uh, that? Yeah, did you get your copy yet? I did not get my copy, but uh, I'll tell the story about how I acquired it, like how I ordered it. It's it's oh, such, yeah, a, yeah, yeah, it's it's such so a cool, cool little system they got set up out there, dude. So mm-hmm. you're not going to find that that book on American Amazon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so you got to make an account on amazonco.jp i think it is is uh how their amazon works and yeah. you put in your order put in all your personal information whatever and there are options to pay card venmo you know your bank account whatever and one of the options was that you could generate a barcode take it to the convenience store you know yeah, right right down the, right down the block or whatever they scan it in and you could give them the yen in your pocket and that and that's what i preferred because it was coming up to the last days of my trip and the book was coming out two days after we left yeah. and that was just too many days before like the unscrupulous proprietors would sneak out their copies because mm-hmm. that's what everybody was saying and then and then you and i we spent we spent our last days like looking Hunting it down. yeah because we did that before we we left right. we left right before it came out but we found it in the store like if you hunt you could find it so i was able to with the money that i had in my pocket uh just go down to the loss i ordered it online just went right to the mm-hmm. loss and they scanned it i gave them money and and uh I play a game when I'm out there and the game is try to get as fucking little change and as few coins as possible. And I actually did have five single yens and stuff. And I'm just like, man, these are bullshit, but they fully came to use yep. when, when I was paying for, for that. But it's still, uh, it's still on the way. Unfortunately, man, like a lot of mm-hmm. people are showing up. Like I just got a text from Jeff Darrow and he's showing off his copy that he oh, got. Nice. So I chose, I chose the wrong shipping method. I'm, I'm, quite certain man i think i think i maybe could have i don't remember there being options for shipping but Mm -hmm. i must have chose a whack version because rob mccollum got his copy like Mm -hmm. a lot of people's copies are showing up and mine is taking uh forever yeah but that'll be an episode totally yeah so i found this weird it wasn't weird it's interesting so i'm not really like a high fashion guy but um, Daniel Klaus worked with Hermes to make a scarf. And if anyone knows about Hermes, you can't buy Hermes, really. You have to, like, be a buyer. So you have to, like, spend a lot of money there. And we're, we buy uh, comics. We don't buy Hermes here. So, But they had this randomly in a Madarake. And I was like, wait, hold on. And so Rachel <clears throat> uh, found it. And we went back and got it. So I want to show off. Actually, I'll put it back. I'll put it in the box so you guys can get the whole experience like I did. So, like, it's it, this is the box it comes in. And like I said, it's a Daniel Klaus. He did a, a scarf with Hermes. So here's the – it was tied around it. Obviously, I took that out. Um, and then you have the Hermes dealer card, which is insane. Like I said, like to – get access to this and even like weird. So to actually be able to buy it was definitely a dub. And so here is what it looks like. And so basically what you're getting is a Klaus comic as a scarf. Um, And it's like, what is it? One, two, I think it's like three or four colors on it, but this thing's uh, super rad, super cool. So this is nice to have in the collection too. Especially if you're a Klaus fan. So uh, the reverse side's the same thing. So you can see it's the, the quality's there. It's on silk. But yeah, so this was an interesting find, Ed. Yeah, it was amazing. And, and you know, like just uh, not to correct you, but but it wasn't even an Amanda Rake, man. Like it was no. it was like a, just a high-end fashion store, like kind of along the way. Like, right, you know, right, we right. hit one yeah. Mandarake and then you go to like another spot and then Rachel got the eagle eyes, you know, and mm-hmm. and she just spotted that Klaus like in in that bougie <laughs> store, 
Right. And then you pulled that classy move, man, where it's like, we're all about to leave. And you're like, oh, I, Rachel, I, I, I need to grab Rachel for a second. And then like, <laughs> and then you, you guys pop right back down. Right. And then we're on the train, man, looking at Klaus Hermes fucking babushkas and shit, dude. Right. And Pretty people, fucking wild. Yeah. And people are, are nuts about that. Like I showed it off on, uh, online and, and, um, people were flipping because they never like saw that colorway before, you know, mm. like, I think, I don't know how they, how they do it, but like, I saw at least five or six different colorways yeah, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. of that piece. And, and it might be regional, right? you know, like that might be the Japanese colorway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that could totally be correct. Because um, like I said, the dealer card is like a verified Hermes dealer. So it's one of those things where, um, it might be regional or, or exclusive to, or like it's one of the few, like not limited, but you know, like maybe more of an experimental color or something. So yeah, it's hard to say, but when I saw that, I was like, and it was really affordable. I'm not going to talk about the price, but if you guys look up the price for our mess for the scarf, um, I I'll say I, it was one six of the price of retail. Yeah. So it was like, basically if you, like Klaus and you like his art, but can't afford it. That's the way to go. You know what I mean? Something a little bit more exclusive and, you know, you can always use it as a flex if you want to, but we're not here for that. Yeah. Blow your nose <laughs> into it. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'll just wipe my ass with it. It's like, oh, look. <laughs> who cares? But yeah. So then, uh, we kind of, um, we'll veer for a second. And if that's cool with you to, uh, K fab games, Let's do it. Is that cool? Yeah, we could do that, man. Like, I, I, one one thought on mine though was, uh, on top of like the Hermes Cloud stuff, mm -hmm. man. You got some furniture for the crib. I don't know if any of that. Oh yeah. Any of I that is close that. by. Yeah, yeah. I can grab it. Or hey, Rachel. Let's see if she can grab it. <laughs> Why? When she grabs that, I'll show off the um, animation stuff I got. Yeah, do that, and 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 like you know, like. We don't got to bury the lead. There is a uh, Takashi Murakami store mm -hmm. in Nakano Broadway. He uh, he owns a chunk of the fourth floor. He's got a little cafe in there, and there's the elusive, the elusive Murakami store, like a pop up shop, that uh, exists on that fourth floor. You and I tried many times to. Uh, to check check out the spot and to to no avail like remember the first time that we went to try to check it out when when the door when the door was yeah when the door was like half open and we were yeah. like oh dude look we can finally see in and the workers they slammed it in our fucking face <laughs> <laughs> but it was open you were able to actually get gain entry yeah so i think it was open because of golden week okay I really think so. And so it's like one of those things where it's like, you know, I collect art. So, you know, Mirakami's right up there. So my first gift, actually how I got into him was uh, Hakeem, who went with the trip on us. He bought me this a long time ago. And so it was always one of those pieces where I was like, you know what? This is super fresh, super fly. So I was like, if I can, I'm going to buy a lot of these in Japan. So with the store being open, we were able to scoop up some of these. Super cool, super fun. Um, I ended up getting three of them, which is great. Now, when you buy them over in Japan, so the first one I got that Hakeem got me, uh, that was actually from MoMA in New York. We ordered it from them. And, you know, they're going to wax. It was like three fifty, But when you get over there, with the yen being so weak, you know, we're copping these for like half that, um, a little bit less than half, actually. So I was able to like max out my collection. I got three of those, and then I got a plush also. So they consider that stuff small, uh, soft sculptures. And so if you ever get a chance when you're there, um, definitely the store is never open. So if you can somehow get into that store, buy as much as you can pack. You know, <laughs> and, <laughs> because and you're not getting back in. I guarantee at the next time we go, that store is not going to be open. Yeah, dude. You know? That that was that was a fun day, man, because you guys hit that spot up early. Like 
Yeah. Nakano Broadway, like the Mandarakes don't open till noon, but other shit is open there. I'm not sure what time you guys went there. We got there. I got there. So the store opened at, I think, 11, and we were in line at 1030. And it's one of those things where you're like, okay, like I'm not going to like buy into the hype. So I'll go a little early. But we were there, and the line was already around the corner. And these are kind of like um, art spaces so people are really into it so they record there was like three or four people doing videos there yeah before the store was even open like it's a big deal and so that was kind of wild to actually experience that and to actually see the culture behind it you know what i mean did you know did you have to prepare like it wasn't just a shot in the dark that you guys went to Nakano Broadway and were like, hey, we'll see if it's open this time. Like, you knew it was going so, to be so open? This is how bad it is typically, Ed. So last time we were there, I was trying to get in the store, but the system was so flawed. If you follow the Instagram page, they'll tell you like, oh, we're going to be open this time. That I think they were fucking with me because the date and the, the day, like let's say Monday, didn't line up with the date. It was like, let's say November 12th. And let's say that day was actually a Sunday. They had it marked for like Wednesday. I was like, is this a, a puzzle? <laughs> you know, like, it was like the real bullshit. And so I was like, it's never going to be open because it's like unprofessional or just like their artist. You know what I mean? Like, that's just what it is. So for it to actually be open and to get in there, we did know because uh, they said it and Hakeem went there the day before. Um, and so they were open the entire week, which is like crazy. Um, to actually, like I said, get access because Mirakami um, is his his office or some space like that's there, right, Ed? Yeah. Um, in the same area, so you assume that like it would be open, but don't assume that at all if you go there. The yeah. odds of it being open, assume it's not going to be open. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah, and you, you know, know where it is, man, because the little grate that they pull down, like it's the only store that, that like has a grate. Usually, like they just they got their windows and 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 they just you know lock the door. But his, it's like those pull down fucking gates yeah, that just exactly. have his art all and over that, it. And he has security there. Like he has his own security. Like they were there regulating everything. It was serious, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like then, when we when we connected that day, like. I couldn't believe you guys actually got in. And then for a good chunk of the day, like you're walking around with fucking big ass bags full right. of uh, yeah. soft sculptures, as you call them. <laughs> yeah, the soft sculptures, right? And it's funny because it's like a weird flex, right? Where people who see it, it's like, because as Americans, we associate that with like money and high art, but they're, they don't even give a shit. They're like, whatever. You know right. what I mean? So it's kind of funny to like see the value systems, how we, how we treat that um also there at that um Madarake, they had the animation spot yes like there. like the the evangelion place that's a different that's not going to broadway for sure but that is like some in the cut black market not associated right. with Madarake. no no spot. not at all it's, it's it's its own spot yeah so last time we were there, Ed uh, got me hip to the spot, and it was like, okay, this is slick, but they only take cash. And it's like, okay, man, like, I can't, somebody dropped, like, I saw them drop, like, 1500 it would be, like, American, on, like, a Goku cell. You know what I mean? Like, people spin there. So it's like, oh, okay, only cash. But this time around, I was prepared, and so I was able to get some animation cells and some sketches. The cool thing about this is that the stuff's always affordable. But what I really got keened in on was like the guy next stuff. Obviously, it's my favorite. But um, the drawings were where it's at this time around. I'll start off with the painted cells. So this is from Nadia the Blue Water, if you can see that. Um, so this, um, this stuff is super affordable. Um, it's accessible. Um, we're talking like 30 to 60 bucks for any of this stuff as we go through it. So it's one of those things where just having a piece of this history. Um, and so, for example, this doesn't show the face. So it's going to be really affordable. Anything with like a uh, main characters, um, painted cells, especially like key scenes are going to be like thousands of dollars. 
but this stuff is super affordable. So you can just even walk away with a piece of history, um, you know, that's affordable for yourself. So those were the two painted animation cells I got. And the rest are drawings. Um, here's one of them. Ed really fell in love with this one because it's more structural. And you can see how tight they get in there with the details with these drawings. So even something that would be considered simple or like dry or boring, it's still, they put in a lot of work. So you can just get an idea of how rich these images actually are in person. And then here's another one. Uh, once again, you can use these for study guides. Um, if you're learning how to draw, there's a lot of structure lines in this. And you're getting these from like the key animators. So that's really cool to see. Now, oh yeah, actually this one was considered a lot. Um, L-O-T, where they um, put them together. So these were sold back to back like this. And so um, something like this was um, less than a hundred bucks. And like I said, you're walking away with a good chunk of knowledge and a good chunk of history. And then this one I got, and there's the last one. So I was able to walk away with like a full episode of <laughs> Evangelion. <laughs> so yeah, so this was really cool to get access to. Once again, you can't get this stuff in America. If you go online, you don't know if it's real or not. So go to the source, buy it there, have the experience. You can't go wrong. I saw Shin Godzilla uh, since I, since I've been back, man. Oh yeah, with with the with, with the uh, with the Anno on the mind, yeah, type shit, man. Isn't it incredible? Oh, it's great. Like, what's cool is it's it's um because Anno is like, you know, incel kind of yeah, super like, otaku. Yeah, like no bullshit, and that's the, that's what's cool about Evangelion is like it starts off running, man, with yeah. such little nonsense and such a little character shit it's like we're going to give you the fly shit off the cuff off the bat and that's what i liked about shin godzilla is like we're not yeah. getting into human relationships and and like having a love story that takes place yeah. in the Fuck midst that. of godzilla it's like nah dude let's 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 yeah. get the show on the road uh he still gets stuff in there you know he still he still it's it it's, it's got a point of view and and it's certainly he's got it looks like he has a lot of very specific feelings about bureaucracy and right. and getting shit done in the midst of cataclysm you know like right. those are some things that are definitely talked about but the imagination is the shit yeah man and that's like the crazy thing so when i saw it at the theaters and then when i seen it again recently from our first trip um, it was like, I, it kind of has a different lens on it at that point because you're like, you can like, it's more relatable. So experience getting to see it through you Ed, in the sense of like you, that's your third trip to Japan. So to see it, you're like, Oh man, that it probably has a whole different view on it versus just looking at it from the lens of an American, you know? Yeah. I mean, you think about Fukushima uh, and you think about, you know, just mm -hmm. the, the, the Kobe earthquake and like just the stuff yeah. that they dealt with and, and with the. <laughs> through the lens of yeah uh, so that's kaiju. Really cool. right exactly so and then just to see like how funny it is uh not to go like too nerdy about it but the phase one's the that tail thing in the water and then like that thing that's hemorrhaging blood out of it's like it's really blood. gross <laughs> yeah. it's real disgusting it's have it has its period all over uh shinjuku <laughs> I was like, man, that's fucking awesome. So yeah, yeah that's like one of my favorite Godzilla films ever. Yeah, it's, it's got it's so got those like fetus eyes, you know. It's got those like proto like like the Steve Bissett tyrant when the dinosaur's still in the egg kind of eyes that don't right. blink or nothing. Yep, totally. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to Cayman Rider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one's gonna be um awesome. I saw um Ultra was it Ultraman? Shin yeah, Ultraman? You, know, you know he that wrote that and that, produced that. that. One, that one, of fan service to it in the sense of like you gotta be a fan of Ultraman but I liked it a lot I thought it was awesome but I'm a big Anno fan so yeah yeah like I said he 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 wrote that one he produced it I don't think he directed that one but I do right. think, but I do think he did uh directs the forthcoming Cayman Rider one yeah he's I think he's all in on that one yeah 
Yeah. Which is going to be amazing. There was that show called Blue Blazes where it's about a mangaka who who uh, went, went to the same art school, that Osaka School of Art or whatever, with the Gainax dudes, like, you know, with Ano and shit. And mm-hmm. they use the real student films and the things that they made as kids, like in the program. And Ano made a uh, like a Ultraman Super Eight, you know. Yeah, you can watch that on YouTube. They even have a toy of him because it's like his outfit's so generic with the jacket. That's they fun. made a toy of Ano as Ultraman from his like eight millimeter film. Yeah, it's amazing. It's so amazing. <laughs> like uh, the show's called Blue Blazes. Uh, it, it shows up on those weird sites and then it disappears. So you can find it online. I, I totally recommend it because the culmination of the show, like the Blue Blazes, the mangaka, it was a real mangaka who is not affiliated with Gainax. It just ha- so happens that he was in art school with those dudes. So he has his arc is the main arc and it's to the side. But the more interesting thing and probably what made the show possible or interesting enough to put on tv was that the culmination for the gynax part right of of uh of this the, their education and stuff is is daikon daikon right uh what three and four or whatever man four. like so yep. so, mm-hmm. so both of those animations that were done for yeah, which is, the crazy part about that Ed, is that they still have those um student animations when like you know we were looking at the scene where the one guy was drawing and then uh, they went over and saw Otto's drawings. Yeah, man. <laughs> he passes out. It was like, but it's still to see that it's like almost um, revel, like revelations esque in the sense of like Otto's ascension. You know what I mean? It's like he's like the man when it comes to that because those early animations were insane. Yeah, you know, it, it just need levels of ambition, and they illustrated it great on the show because the whack animation was still good it was just like a very simple character running towards the camera and uh you know five drawings or something to get you there Anos yeah. was a fucking car falling onto another car with shit busting out and the tires get it was just the level of ambition was just right. so, like so so much higher did you ever see the i got hold of the daikon like a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of the Daikon opening animations um, in like 98, 99 on, on, on VHS. I didn't see any of that Ed, until YouTube. It was, That's yeah, it, it, it was uh, this dude, Dave, man, he was old head. Uh, and he, uh, he had that. So he just, would just, he would just drop science on me. You know, he knew I was like an enthusiastic kid and mm-hmm. he was fucking with um, tape trading anime and shit like that man, yeah, yeah. since like the early yeah. 80s right and dave well, is a cool about, cat Ed, for for you to see that before the internet like the context for that daikon you're seeing like alien superman and all that stuff and you're like that wouldn't make any sense you know what i mean he explained it and and was like you know at the beginning of these conventions so like not only did like he have the tape but he had some context for it it was like it was like those networks you know and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he had some context for it and it was like, you know, die, daikon means radish. And and like I, he would just give me all that knowledge and then like let me borrow that because that was the era, right, where you would like get a hold of a full, cool tape. And, you know, I made like a sixth generation dub off of that. Yep. And his is like, you know, a fifth generation and it's like barely... Mm-hmm visible but you could like oh shit there's a xenomorph oh shit there's fucking star wars dudes boba fett stormtroopers all this kind of crazy shit all in the same video superman batman all in the same video like how is this legal how is this possible it's not uh the 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 cool thing about youtube is like we we you can watch it crystal clear and perfect yeah because like to me that's that's a that's a luxury man because like my shit was like it was like that skinamax porn type shit where it's like wobbly and fucking fuzzy (laughs) totally yeah yeah that's incredible yeah no i didn't see until youtube like i knew about it and it's always been rumored but you know until you have access you don't have access so yeah it was definitely youtube for me there's some real like because of media and you know the invention of vhs and all and 
and video rental stores, all that stuff. You know, a lot of directors and shit, they, they never, they never, um, like sign deals that would, you know, that's the writer strike in Hollywood now is like, you know, streaming wasn't a part of the right. language in the past or whatever. So they got to like get that language added into it. It's not like the bosses at Hollywood are going to do you any favors if you don't fucking turn up a little bit. Right. Exactly. And, uh, I was talking with, um, Charlie Ahern, the dude who directed wild style himself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I remember seeing that like you could, um, through source magazine, there was classified ads in the back and you could just get like a bootleg of it in a black clamshell. And like, that's how we all saw it before Rhino video got the right. license or whatever. And Charlie Ahern was like, yeah, that was me. Like, that's so funny. Yeah. Like, because I, you know, he signed some like fucking weird deal that, um, whatever right. bullshit company existed back then, like they didn't anticipate VHS being a deal, you know, being a thing. So right. like there was no distribution for that. So he ha had to just do that on the low key on, on his mm -hmm. own, you know, like, I'm sure it, like, like there are things that I could do like with, with my shit where it's like, as long as you do like less than 5,000, you don't get in no trouble, that type of shit. Right. Yeah. yeah so yeah. like, you know, it's probably the same kind of, kind of deal for him, but right. uh, uh, a racer head was the same. Like, I didn't realize that. Like you couldn't, you couldn't um just, just rent a racer head when we were kids, man. Like, right. like it was these weird fucking comic convention bootlegs is how we all got this shit. Right, right. I still have yeah, my clamshell. That's funny. Yeah, it's that's how I actually got a lot of my anime um, was through conventions. Like, you know, I think the first time I seen Perfect Blue, I saw it in like an ad. Um, but it wasn't an American ad. They were talking about it and reviewing it, the Japanese release. And then I literally went to a convention in '97 or something like that, and they had it there. So and it had like it was a sub on it. Yeah. But it was like kind of crazy just to get access. So. There was something to be said about getting things access to things that were like a big deal in Japan, you know, they have them directly super quick in America just through a convention, you know? Yeah. So like that whole channel, like and it's interesting because I don't think there's a culture for that anymore. You know what I mean? It's all, um, it's pretty easy to get stuff now. And, and yeah. it's just like, it's incumbent upon you to do so uh, at this point, which is the cool thing. Like, it's like, you have this access and you can mm -hmm. do that, you know, like, like, uh, you know, people who spend, spend time with me all like a lot, uh, are always like, I'm with you all the time, but like, how, how are you figuring this stuff out? I don't see you doing anything. And it's like, nah, dude, you, all you gotta do is read. Like, like, it's not like I'm sitting there fucking jerking off. Like, right, right, like right. is my head not in a book? Right. Is exactly. my face not in a book? I, am I not? listening to audiobooks as i'm drawing comics all right. day it's like the time is being used and you right. know just because you know not playing super mario or some shit like like i'm taking in information right exactly yeah no i like that should we make that pivot to the to the video games did did we exhaust all oh you know yeah. you 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 brought up perfect blue like did you end up buying any of those satoshi khan uh books and comics no, I did not because I couldn't find out much details about them. So um, I have them on the list. So what happened is that they're reprinting his books in Japan, um, probably just because of his death and everything. And probably the storyboard books probably did really well. So they're putting out editions of his original mangas and the mangas that he worked with other people. And there's like three or four of them in these deluxe editions. And they're a little oversized, um, not as big as the Akira. Um, but also not as small as this. So they're kind of like somewhere in between this, these two sizes. And um, obviously it's in Japanese. So it has, um, I think, interviews. Um, but then it has the uh, the reprinting of the uh, books. But yeah, I haven't got any of those. I have them on the list. I'm going to research them and go from there. But yeah, those look really solid. So if anyone hasn't um, did the dive into Shatoshi Khan's mangas those are definitely something to keep an eye out for i guarantee those are going to come to america ed yeah. that's also kind of why i held off on them yeah you know? yeah he's very 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 much a prized creator uh mm -hmm. to to us here in the states 
So listen, man, if that if that's the books, man, let's pivot to uh let's go let's do uh Ooh. video game yeah, yeah, kayfabe, yeah. man. We we, we right. don't have yeah. we don't have Uncle Jeff Darrow sitting here. We don't want him to be bored, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so like out. so like we're here doing our thing. And <laughs> totally. uh the kayfabers know that Eddie P fucks with Nintendos and shit like that and Genesis Sega and all this. So let's take it to yeah. that place, dude. Oh yeah. So like I'm a huge gamer. A lot of people don't know it because like as an artist like they think i'm pretentious so because i paint and i know a lot about art history but like at one bond that ed and i have are like video games because we're old school nes dudes um rpgs nes rpgs super nintendo um and so what happened i'll tell a story first about the new zelda game and then we'll go into the retro stuff let's do it so what happened is the new zelda came out for a Switch, and obviously it's like the sequel to Breath of the Wild. It's this big deal. So in Japan, it's like, this was my first time experiencing this. It was like serious. And so at the corner stores at the Lawson's, they had Zelda food. So <laughs> it's like, this was like days before. This is like building up. And then every place that I visit would have like um, One Piece promotion. Everything changed basically overnight to Zelda. Like you couldn't walk anywhere in Tokyo without Zelda promotion somewhere. But mostly it's at the corner stores, but still. Anyway, so I'm like, okay, well, I was like on some hype shit and like huge Nintendo fan. That's my favorite system. Um, and so I was like, well, let me go get the game, right? And this was like at um, Nintendo Tokyo. Uh, this is in Shibuya inside the mall on like the seventh floor. The entire floor has like three or four uh, stores and the main one's Nintendo. And that's where the Pokemon store is. Anyway, so I'm there and they're running this promotion where you buy these tickets. Uh, Japan's really into gambling. So <laughs> anything they could do to gamble, they're gonna do it. So they have this chart. They would walk around with it, holding it. And it was these tiers of how you can win prizes. So it's a, B, C, D, E. E is going to be like um, coasters or like little cards, something like cheap. And then as you go up, um, when you get the C tier, it's going to be like a coffee mug. B tier is going to be a little blanket, a Zelda blanket. And then the A tier is the Master Sword. It's only the one tier you got, right? So, you know. I'm a gambler, man. So I was like, okay, so it was $7 a ticket. So I was like, okay, if I buy four tickets, these are still better odds, but I don't feel guilty or feel ripped off. You know what I mean? So that's like 28 bucks American. So I'm like, okay, so bought my four tickets. Now, when you buy these tickets, the process is, and this, lo this like line is long because everyone is a fanatic at this point. So I'm in line, you go up, you tell them how many tickets you want. You buy the tickets. And then um, you go next to this, like, bowl. And then you pick out your tickets. They take the tickets from you. You don't even get to hold them. And they rip them open. And then so each inside each ticket is the letter. Um, and so this is, like, straight hustle, guys. Like, it was some bullshit. The first three I got were all E's. Ah. And I'm like... It's like so all three were ease i was like you guys probably know where this story is going by this point but i wasn't necessarily let down but i'm just like oh this is a racket like this is some shit they would do in the hood you know? <laughs> some three car monty type shit <laughs> yeah so actually yeah i was comfortable with it but then, <laughs> so then she opens the last one and it was an a which means that's the master sword so what they do is they ring this bell it's a loud cow bell it's like, ding, 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 ding. it's like, like stock market type shit. And the entire store turns and claps because it's like, you're like the main character at this point, you know? What I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, so then she goes, oh, you got A. And so this was the prize, the exclusive master sword that you could only get at the Nintendo World Store by doing a raffle for a ticket. So this was pretty fun to get. Um, obviously, I got the game that day um, also. So yeah, so that's pretty cool. And then 
um, we were on a mission. I talked to Ed about this before we even went. I was like, yo, our last trip, I was like, Neo Geo. We have to get a Neo Geo. And if you guys know anything about Neo Geo, super expensive. So back in the day, you'd look in the game pros and everything. And this fucking system, the system was around seven, $800, I think. Yeah, it's like $650 or something. I, I seem to remember. Yeah. And this is like literally, but you all know the story. It's Six, like, $650 in 1990. Yeah, It's over exactly. $1,000 right. to, to us now. Right, exactly. And so what happened is that like I was broke growing up. I'm like, I'm never going to have this. But as an adult child, I was like, I have to have this. So if you go to Japan, it's going to be cheaper than ordering it off the internet. So I knew that much. So like we get over there. Now, the system, the reason it costs so much is because it's a um, direct arcade board. So it's going to be one-to-one. You don't have any deterioration or any, like, cut frames, anything like that. So you're getting the pure arcade experience from Neo Geo SNK. Yeah, so like, what, what would happen back in the day, man, is, uh, like, I remember playing Altered Beast at the movie theater, and the first time seeing it, like, and just like, oh, cool, man. You get four, three of these orbs, you turn into a cool, cool uh, monster, and then you get powers and you beat a bad guy and it's fucking rad. The colors were amazing because I was only used to, like, Nintendo level color, right. you know, like, 8-bit graphics. And uh, you you play these games. Like, like Sega had, like, 16-bit games since, like, 1984, you know, right. with, like, with, like, beautiful, lush color and shit. And... And uh, when I saw that the Genesis existed, like it was like a new system, 1989. I got I got it when I was in second grade, and it was packed in with Altered Beast. That was the game, and I fucking loved playing Altered Beast at the theater. And got this system, dreamt of fucking Altered Beast. Like I, I I'm, I'll be able to play this at my own house. Like right. I was thinking about all the different ways that I was going to be able to take a um thermometer and put on the the light bulb to like stay home from school and shit like that just so I could play fucking altered beast all day and then you you bring it home and you get it and it is uh, a port it is not exactly what you played at the arcade it's completely recognizable with that game you know and all the same mechanics and the move sets and all that shit is there but there's like a level of polish that is a step down because you know, the more chips you put onto something, the more expensive it was. And you exactly. need and you needed lots of chips and things, man. Uh, so, like, mm-hmm. when you brought that shit home, you scale it down, you get the same play, but it doesn't look as pretty. And the Neo Geo was the promise that, like, those fucking Samurai Showdown games that you play in the big red cabinets, you know, uh, at, at the arcade, like... The thing that you're going to play at your crib is the exact same pixel perfect version Mm. of those games. But because of that, there's a lot of chips involved. Uh, It's a very expensive proposition. Like even those SNK consoles um, would would be expensive for for the arcade. But the beauty of it was that they only had to spend money to like upgrade games and shit rather than like get a whole new cabinet, Mm -hmm. you know? And, but those, but those boards are $200 a piece. Right. So, yeah. So what happens is that, um, when you get the system and obviously if you haven't seen one before, well, there it is, man, you, you, you got, we found the system. We found the system. Now the cool thing about this one, Ed, was that I didn't realize there were two super potatoes. Right. And, and right. so we were at the first one, which is the one everyone goes to, the popular one. Yes, in Akihabara. Cool. Yep, that was cool. But then Ed's like, no, there's another one. I was like, yo, where are we got to go to that one, bro. For sure. So like that, that's, that's, that, that's the one where um, last time when we were there, I was with you for a bunch. And then you guys split. And when you split, I had another round of friends come. And they're, mm-hmm. and they're video gamers, man. So like... They found that super potato because, like, I knew there were the two, and I knew that the, the one in Ikebekuru was the small one. And mm-hmm. my dude was on the hunt for Doki Doki Panic 
the original sort of skin for what became the American Super Mario Brothers 2. And he was on the hunt for that, just like as like a historical object. He has the disc system. So like, that's mm-hmm. cool, you know, play the play the fucking original thing. It was an, right. like a Sears exclusive game. So it wasn't like in stores the way regular right. games were and shit harder to find. He found it. He found it for a steal at uh at that Icky Beckaroo Super Potato. And then there was like a piece of time where where like you guys were on something. And then I just had some time to kill. And I went to Icky Beckaroo. And fucking mm-hmm. went to that uh, super potato just to see what it was about. And on the outfacing wall, or just like on the racks, you know, the standard shit, not even a wall bo- uh, game or whatever, a case game, it was fucking Snatcher, dude. Just like, which is crazy. Just chilling right there as like something Never you just pick up and grab. Life. Yeah. Yeah. So, was- so, so then, you know, a day or two later, I'm like, B Moss, I don't think it will be a waste of time for you to, uh, visit this icky beckaroo super potato with me hell no so oh. then this this is when we found this guy there and surprisingly the system's actually really light because um with the aes there's two versions the mvs is the arcade board um the a aes is the consoleized version so this is actually really light because all the chips are in the game so if you guys thought the you know like those videos where it's like, oh, you show the thirteen year old, twelve year old kid a VHS tape, they're like, what is this? You know, that's like the reaction you get when you show people a Neo Geo game. Look at that; okay, that looks substantial. This is, yeah, this is like a weapon. So <laughs> we're gonna go through this, and I'm gonna insert it into the systems and show you guys like how it works. So this is the case for it which is like bigger than a VHS case, right? And you can see, and this thing's heavy. This is heavier than the system. So you can see it has two boards in it, which tells you like, um, like back in the day, they would do bits. So like 16, oh no, megs, 32 meg, blah, 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 meg. So they would put that on there as promotion. So like a 32 meg game was like big for like Genesis or something like that. Now, this is uh, Samurai Showdown 2, and it's 202 megs. So just if you would compare that to, like, games at the time, you know, this is, like, this is insane. This would be, like, um, gigs to um, megabytes, at you know, if you're scaling it up. So this thing is heavy. You can even hear it. There's a lot of hardware inside there. Yeah, totally. So, um... Here's what the booklet looks like, if anyone was curious. So pretty standard, pretty straightforward. Um, this one's pretty nice. It's uh, black and white still, but high quality printing, you know, standard. Now, why'd you choose thing, that game? Why'd you choose that game? Oh, Lost? actually, yeah. So Samurai, Samurai Showdown. Um, so Neo Geo, I played in the arcade when it first came out. Um, fell in love with it immediately. And so they had a game called Samurai Showdown. They call it Samurai Spirit in... Um, in Japan, but Samurai Shadow 2 is actually my favorite game on the Neo Geo. But the cool thing about it is that no one likes the game, so it's like super affordable. So I got this game for like 30 bucks essentially. Now, when you insert to the system, it's no different than any other cartridge. But if you guys saw the Tower of Power with the Sega 32X and the Sega CD was something. <laughs> you kind of see how big this thing gets pretty quickly. So when people come over, they're like, what the hell is this thing now? You know what I mean? And they're like, yo, you got a Neo Geo? So yeah, so it's actually pretty advanced because it had a memory card slot. And this system's from 1990. So that's pretty uncommon. Now, the thing is, is that it's a, um, a mono um, output. So when you play it through the TV, it's mono. But on the front, it has headphones and an output jack for stereo. So it's actually like pretty innovative that way, too, for being an old system. So, yeah, so this was the grail I picked up. And Ed and I were on the hunt for this for like two weeks. We found it about a week and a half in, I think. And only one. It's the only one that we found on the hunt, yeah. man. Like there was there were no other Neo Geos to be found anywhere. We we got teased out a bit because we yeah. saw Neo Geo boxes at uh, different stores. But that was like just display items illustrating that they 
had had retro energy like in that part of the store or something like this and it was just kind of a cock tease but like the experience of you scooping that up it was it was so fun to watch and it was cheap i've never you got the cheapest neo geo right. that has ever been sold and wow. okay. and it it's a testament to the quality that japan holds dear with their with their goods uh because mm -hmm. there's like the minorest scuffs that are meaningless to you or i and that it's it's almost like when you get like scratch and dent um appliances or something like if you order a, a fridge that in shipping like gets a little nick on it it could save you five hundred dollars you know and right. and uh that was the deal dude like that thing had the most superficial cosmetic nonsense that you and i would never even notice like if they didn't show it off to you you wouldn't be salty yeah. about it no um you could probably see one of the blemishes that as referring to the scratches right here yeah right there like that's just i mean the system's from 1990 so you we expect that you know what i mean so for it to be like and they were like reducing the price uh, based off of that. So let's put it like this. It costs as much as a Switch costs. So you could look up those prices and figure that out. Yeah. But that's, for this system, when it came out, like I said, 650 700 bucks. And we're talking like, that's not even importing. That's just the cost of the system. And then the game... It's were... true bec because you would never... Like, it was such a rare boutique item that it wasn't even at Toys R Us, really, I don't think, man. No, like, I, like there wasn't a I've pool tab for that. In America, like, i seen, pe like, hardcore people have it, but I never even played it. They just, like, oh, I have a Neo Geo, here it is, you know, type thing, um, along with all their other crazy stuff they have in their collection. But, so it was, like, more of a, va a vanity kind of thing. Because if you like Neo Geo, it's pretty specific. It's, like, specific to the games, you know? So it's like most of the catalogs fighting games, there's only like 160 games, I think. And then these car these cartridges, this is this 40, 30, 40 dollar cartridge is considered cheap. If you buy high-end Neo Geo games that are popular, um, you're talking around two thousand dollars for a game, fifteen hundred for a game, a thousand dollars for a game. And that's like net current prices. Yeah. And it's not even necessarily rare it's just that that's what the demand it sustains you know that that value yeah yeah like like i'm sure i'm sure they are rare in in the sense yeah, of video I, games man because i i could imagine that there's maybe only a couple thousand of a lot of them yeah yeah I, and you're lucky if that like so for example the main ones uh mark of the wolf it's like a fatal fury like late release i think like 2004 and that game's a two thousand dollar game um, the people who own it, they own it because they want it, right? And they play it. So it's like one of those things where if you're into Neo Geo, you're into Neo Geo. So just to be able to start out with this, you know, on this on a very like affordable level is like, I mean, it's a dream come true. Oh, dude, you know? I, I feel it, man. Like your win is my win, dude, because I I never met anybody who had a Neo Geo, even, even like this in a late period situation or, you know, somebody with like extra income type shit. I've never seen anybody have it. Um, I, no. and as you were like acquiring it, uh, like I was fucking over the moon for you. <laughs> Thank you. And it, and, and dude, it was, it was like, um, what do you call it, man? I like, you got the game before we, you got the system. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so I'm it's about, like tempting I'm fate. About game like the week before, I was like, I'm not leaving Japan without it because it's one of those things where I made, I brought just like a suitcase for this specifically because I was like, I'm going to find this. It's going to be big because if you think about it, when you pack these two items in a suitcase, this is like the room it's going to take up. So, and then that's not the controller. The controller is as big as the system. Yeah. So you have three items that are like substantially big that are going to take up one whole suitcase. And then you got to pay a hundred dollars for that suitcase. So you're committing still, but that's like the cheapest, like barrier to entry. Like even the rich kids and back in like the day, they didn't even have like a Neo Geo. They would have like, you know, the turbo graphics, you know, and the super Nintendo 
and like a Genesis. So they would have like a combo. Now you call them like, out. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you get out good, right? You you landed the turbo graphics, bro. You can't go wrong with that. <laughs> no, nah, but I, I I had those four. I had NES. I had we had Genesis two times because like I got the I had the Genesis with Altered Beast, and then uh, they were they were not putting out good software for a while no. man like yeah, the game the, fun. yeah the, the games were kind of trash for a little while there and and we were off of it and we got rid of it for um super nintendo and then yeah. when sonic came out it was the revitalization and my brother like uh there was mario lemieux hockey and this is pittsburgh man and my kid brother was was stoked on that mario lemieux hockey so mm. we we got the system again and in yep. the midst of that, so it would be like first grade, got NES, second grade, got Genesis, third grade was Baltimore, got Turbo Graphics. Man, that's that's the crazy one right there, Ed. Yeah, yeah, and and that was totally me falling victim to advertising in Marvel comic books with those two page spread comic strips of Bonk, but more importantly, Splatterhouse. Yeah, this firehouse double pay. Double and spread. I fucking drew that dude with the mask a bunch, man. And I couldn't. Every time I go to the mall, I'd be going to that section and like looking at the, re, reading the back of sp the Splatter House jewel case. Yeah. Er, er, early red room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can can you defeat the maggot eating boss? Was the challenge they issue, and I'm like, I think I can. I think I have to try to defeat the right. maggot eating boss, man. Yeah. No, totally, dude. Well, it's funny because, like, yeah, it was actually a, a thing. Like, you would get a system every year. I was the same way. Like, it's like, oh, we get income tax, so what system do you want this year? It's like, oh, let me get the Game Boy, you know? So that's, like, your one thing you're going to get every year, and I would just save the system. So, like, that's how you'd accumulate them. So, yeah, I feel you on that. Yeah, but that Neo Geo, like, like my parents were basically like, you motherfucker, get a job. Yeah, like, uh, but even even like a job, like it was so hard to make money back in the day. So like, minimum wage was like three twenty five, three fifty when I started working at fourteen. By the time I was like eighteen, the it was like eight bucks, maybe nine bucks. So like, you still couldn't afford a Neo Geo. <laughs> no, like like I said, there was not one person I knew. There was not one person I knew that had it. There was like, that's that's when you start to learn about the. Uh, like the habitual liars in class and shit like that who are like, oh, I got the Neo Geo, but it's at my dad's house. Yeah, it's all that's cat, man. It's, yeah, no, 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 no divorce kids is getting the Neo Geo. <laughs> well, I, I would, I would, I would suggest that maybe they're the only ones who get it when if the dad is trying to like buy Billy buy some love, fun. man. Right. Yeah. Buy some love in 1990, which your, which your shorty, you hook them up right. with that Neo Geo, man. Uh, do you have some other games on the mind that you oh, want to get for that bitch? Right, exactly. So I want to get, um, so I ordered like they have like a cart, you know, that has like all the games on it. Um, so I ordered that. That should be here soon. Um, but I still want to collect like some specific key games. So obviously Metal Slug, anything in that series. And those carts are actually, some of them are affordable. When you get to like Metal Slug 4 and 5, even 3, it starts getting really expensive. Yeah. Um, and some of the games were actually re released in America. Mm -hmm. So, like, the American version of the uh, Metal Slug, the first game, is, like, a really expensive game. Um, there's this other game called, I think it's called Defenders? I just learned about this game. It's a fighter that's, like, back in um, circulation of, like, you know, competitive fighting games. And that one's really affordable, so I'm going to check that out. And then outside of that, um, King of Fighters, Samurai Showdown, you know, the classics. So go that direction. So, yeah, I would say for Neo Geo, it's going to be a very um, affordable. I'm not going to, like, go anything over 120 bucks when buying games just because, like, um, but they did make an EverDrive for it. Yeah. But, but that EverDrive has been out of print. And that thing's expensive now. That EverDrive for it, Ed, I think, is around twelve hundred dollars now. Yeah, yeah, like, like it's just like, um, like the Terra Onion shits, man, for like a Saturn yeah. or, a, yeah. or a uh, the Super CD for for the um Turbo Graphic. It's just like <sighs> supply and demand. Like 
they just didn't make that many. So right. they're not going to make that many of these carts and, and these ODEs and shit. Uh, right. So, it, you know, it gets dicey. But what, what I do have, because like, because the crib is so comic centric here, you know, like the studio is maxed out on space uh, because of the books and shit. Like I, I, it's impossible to build any other collections and shit. Like it's impossible. Right. So I, I am an Evercart guy, you know? So like yeah. I will get a system when I can back up every game to it, you know? Yep. And, and I pretty much stop it at, at PlayStation two, but I do have this, uh, that amazing arcade stick that Neo Geo put out two, three years yeah, ago. Yeah. There was a USB port on that bitch, you know? And you could get like a little low profile USB dongle, like a little um, thumb drive. And mm -hmm. it's called, um, there's like a suite of games and shit you can put on it called a high low stick. Like that that's the program or whatever. And it, it supplies it with every single Neo Geo game. And then there are these different suites that, that you can add to it. So like there's like a Capcom one where it's like every arcade Capcom game. And then there's like another one where it's like classics. And that's like, I'm working on beating Shinobi with one quarter. Like that's, nice. that's, that's where my head is, man. Is like, let me see if I can beat Shinobi on one. Um, Hell yeah. You know, the Avengers games, Simpsons, X-Men, mm -hmm. like they're all in, on this shit, man. And like, yeah, all the main games. That's what, that that's what makes me, I'm comfortable with that. You know what I mean? Cause like, yeah. cause like I lust after that Neo Geo and the fact that you got that shit, that was like my, that was my victory also, man. I'm like, all yeah, right, cool. Yeah. yeah, hell yeah. Cool. That's amazing. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's like, now that I have it, it's like, I can move on now. You know what I mean? It's like, all right, done with the video game stuff because I have everything. Um, but I do have some more games to show. Yeah. Yeah. That th this is about Holy Grails, too. man. Yeah. This is all Grail stuff at this point. So we got, I'll do the, I'll do Sin and Punishment first because people can buy this game. So this is Sin and Punishment. Um, this one isn't hard to acquire because they make um, ROM, like you could buy a cart with the ROM dump on it. So you can actually buy an American version of this cart, but I wanted the box and everything to it. So this is made by Treasure. It's one of their earlier 3D polygonal games. So it's basically like Star Fox, um, but it has their own characters. Treasure is known for it, if you remember Gunstar Heroes. Yeah. Sega Genesis. So that would be like the high point um, of their first gen type of games. So the cool thing about this game is that it was only like 60 bucks. And this is like a $150 game. And the reason for that, what Ed was talking about earlier with the um, issue of like, if anything's damaged, they reduce the price. And so the cart just has the yellowing, which you can switch this cart out. That's no problem. Um, but yeah, so that's why this was uh, cheap, but we still have everything else for it. the strategy. I mean, the, uh, the uh, booklet and all the plastic still here. So it even has your key for like how to play the game. So yeah, everything's intact. So it's kind of wild to get this almost for retail price. You know what I mean? Was this game ever so released in English? Nope, um, but it's in English. So it has Japanese subtitles with English voice acting for some weird reason. So you can actually play this on Nintendo Switch. Um, and they also, I think they also came out with a second version of this game, like a sequel on the Wii. So you can actually, this game's pretty accessible, honestly. But the reason I bought it is because playing it with the Nintendo 64 controller, that controller doesn't convert well right. to system so when you play it on switch it's a gimped version you're not playing the real game because the controls uh, for 64 are just so archaic and weird yeah you yeah know? you gotta grab that oh that middle piece yeah exactly so you can even see here just from like the setup how specific it is to the system yeah so and that weird c you, button yeah i forgot about all that shit yeah exactly so this is why i wanted this game specifically um so this was definitely and this is one of those things where we we were walking rachel and i and it was sitting there on the shelf not a big deal 
you know, it's just like, oh yeah, 60 American bucks. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So this was definitely um, something great to pick up. Now, the one, this other game that I was looking for, I figured I would find a Neo Geo, but I didn't think I would find this game. This is like a crazy find for me. So this is Elevator Action Returns on the Sega Saturn, which is like one of my favorite systems. Now, this game was only in the arcades, and then it was ported to the Sega Saturn. If anyone knows about Sega Saturn, it's hard to port because it has two different processors, one for 3D and one for 2D. So um, converting the games into other systems or like uh, to play them is damn near impossible. So this game, you could like obviously burn it off of the internet, you know, download it, burn it off and play it. But it's a sequel to the original Elevator Action from the late 70s, early 80s, um, if you remember that game. So this one, but it's not the same. It's basically a 90s uh, action flick um, in the format of elevator action. So this game, Ed, we were at the original Super Potato. And we were looking, it was in the corner of this case that was like really low or whatever. And I was like, wait, is that what I think it is? So yeah, so that was an immediately an immediate buy, but I was like, I had the guilt. I had the purchasing guilt at that point. Did I was you? like, yeah, a little bit. I was like, man, but you know, I had the money, but I was like, do I need to do this on the second day? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we got to do this. So got this game, played it. Probably. I probably, I think I spent between the Neo Geo and this game, I probably put in like 12 hours of gameplay. Like these are like dream games for me. You know what I mean? So there's no, so, so there's no region issues then with uh Sega Saturn games. Oh yeah. No, actually there is. So you have to have a cartridge that fits into the back and it's basically a region and, and like a, um, I do you remember those, um, what are those shark things they were called? It was like, um, a code breakers. They oh, were right. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 Game yeah. shark thing. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So it's basically one of those uh, game sharks that you put in the back of the system and it, um, unlocks any region. So you can play these games super easy. That's why the Saturn imports were like a big deal back in the day. So you go to like electronics boutique Funko land and you would see the Saturn games, the American ones, they were on the bottom. All the imports is what everyone wanted because it was shit like this. So you get this Marvel versus Capcom, um, Panzer Mar Dragoon or whatever, or, or, or yeah. no, not Panzer Dragoon. What was that joint? Um, mm -hmm. well, there is Pan Panzer Dragoon Saga, ah. but that one's the super, that one's super rare. I have that also, but I bought that, um, at retail, but yeah, so there's tons of shit like this that you can only play that's exclusive to like Japanese Saturns. So I had to cop this, but that's definitely like a highlight. And then surprisingly, so when we went to get that Neo Geo at the other Super Potato, um, there was like some cheapies that were really cool. So some of these games would be like rare in America. So like uh, Mega Man X2, um, that was like a $9 game. Whereas in America, it's like a $100 game. Darius Twin. Uh, bonk, super bonk, super rare game in America, but in Japan, it's a eight dollar game, which is awesome. Did the Super the, Famicom uh, carts fit into a Super Nintendo? Yeah, these play directly, Ed. So you can play these. Just pop these in the system, and they play automatically. So anyone who goes to Japan, just pick these up. It's so cheap there, and they had like multiples of these, like uh, Mega Man X2 or Rock Man X2. They had like a stack like that of these so, which is kind of funny to see how popular some of these games were back in the day that you still have like stacks that are like super deep um then we got kid icarus i don't have the disc system but i'm trying not to buy one when we go back ed but <laughs> i might have to try to find a disc system next time <laughs> and then castlevania was originally released on the disc system yeah better sound then it was, yeah then it was put over to the nes so these were uh super cheap super fun to get so yeah that's the game stuff i got which is like you know it was just as exciting as the comics this time yeah 
Yeah, absolutely, man. It was so fun hunting for that stuff. And it's just a different section of town you get to explore. Uh, going mm-hmm. into the different catacombs, culture. fuck with the video game joints. Yeah, it was funny because it felt kind of shitty because we went to the uh, second um, Super Potato and for some reason they only took cash there. And I'm just like, okay, whatever. Like, you know, it is what it is. But I was like, okay, you know, we'll go get cash. But yeah, so that trip, all in all, I would say this trip was super successful. And yeah, you know? totally. I, uh, my last day, I was so, so beat, so exhausted. I had all these like grand plans. I'm like, man, I want to get a whole bunch of uh, dot screens uh, yeah. from, from the Sakaido art store and stuff. And I uh, just couldn't get out of bed, man. I was so so fucking tired. Oh, you got you, you just, yourself some stacks, bro. I had to. Yep, got about thirty of them this time around. Yeah, you know. But yeah, that's unfortunate. You didn't make it there. Yeah, yeah. It was you know it was what it was, man. But like went out with the homies, and mm-hmm. I th- y- 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 went in Rome, right? So like, right. So like, <laughs> as uh their order and shit. I'm just saying yes to it all. And, uh, just assuming that like, you know, it's a world-class city, man. Like, like it's all, it's all gravy. And, right. uh, you ever take a bite of something and just know that it's going to wreck you? <laughs> like, like right after you take a bite of the, of Bro, the some of the things I was eating this time around, cause I felt more ambitious. Yeah. It was questionable. I was like, I'm not sure if I should be eating this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not going to eat shark cartilage anymore because that's mm-hmm. what it was, man. It was shark cartilage yeah. in like a plum sauce or something as just like ah. a little appetizer. Like, you know, because it was a place where you get a bunch of little small things and just fucking yeah. eat off the communal it. joint. And I, like I ate this shark cartilage and and the homies like it's shit that they've always eaten. Mm-hmm. But they the one dude didn't even know what it was. Like, right. like, like, because yeah, he wanted, like, they wanted to explain it. They called it crystals. And then like, they did the Google and shit and they're like, oh no, it's shark cartilage. Dude, like, come on me. On bite two. <laughs> and it was maybe with the knowledge that it was like shark cartilage that like a psychosomatic thing happened or something like that, man. But my stomach yeah. just turned Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I was down dude for a day. Yeah. And it was no, a day I before I split. So like I was actually very scared because like because like uh, I had I had a one power battery in my right. body, dude. Like like a one per, a one percent power battery. <laughs> like I was I was couldn't move really. Like I was I was I was fucked up. Yeah. And I just opted to stay in my room. Um, where my room was, I had no view because I was on that second floor. I had no right. view. Like, like when I open my blind, I'm just facing a brick wall. So I have like no natural light that comes in at all. And uh, it was beneficial that day because right. Only that day. Yeah. because okay. because I uh, knew that like the next day I'm gonna have like a 24 hour travel day that begins when the flight takes off. So that means that it's like a 27 hour day because I have th- three hours ahead of time to like get to the, or the, the flight takes off at five forty five at night, but you got to check out at 10 AM. So mm-hmm. like, what is that? Like 30 hours of, of travel or something right. like that. Like, like it was, yeah. it was a crazy thing. So, so, uh, with a 1% internal battery, I was just like, fuck it. I'm staying in this bed all day and night. And just going to sleep a whole right. bunch and try to like overdose on sleep and have maximum fucking energy for the mm-hmm. travel home. And it definitely worked out, man. It was the smartest play that I that I made the whole time because when it was time to get up and go the next day, not going to lie, 8.45 in the morning or whatever, you know, set the alarm for nine. I am up at like 8.45. I'm looking at my shit and then I'm like, fuck. I feel like I could really be in this bed even longer, even mm-hmm. after being in the whole bed for like 24 hours already. Right. And then, uh, and then, you know how it goes. 
object in motion stays in motion type shit. Mm -hmm. Started to get a move, man, and it was all gravy. Like, like it's like, yeah. all right, man, let's 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 get the fuck back home. Let's yeah. uh, let's take a shower on the fam in the with the familiar water pressure, and mm -hmm. for all of the optimization and cool shit that Japan brings us in terms of almost everything, man. Like, you know, lines to get into the conventions that have you know a hundred thousand people showing up, totally optimized. Got the Japanese right. robot toilets that shoot the water in your butthole. Play play <laughs> musical notes, man, in case other people are in there. And, right. you know, you don't want them to hear your business. A little dryer for your butt. Yep. Vending machines to, like, order your ramen exactly as you wish. Yada, yada. All that stuff. Man, they must have got some D-level student who invented the Japanese pillow. Because... Because... <laughs> I don't know about you, man, but that pillow at the fucking hotels sucks a dick. Bro, let me tell you. So I got like, um, because we were there during Golden Week. So all the all the people who work, they're off. And so we stayed where we stayed at Shinjuku. Um, there was tons. It was basically like the party area, more or less, it felt like. And so there's tons of people out everywhere. So I caught a light cold, and the, which in, induces coughing. And between that shitty pillow and me coughing, I pulled like muscles in my <laughs> neck because the pillows. And I was like, wait, this is some bullshit. Everything like I'd say, very efficient. But then when it came to the pillow, it was like you get like a flat one. Which is normal, I guess. Like that would be just kind of like your folding pillow. Then they had this other cheap pillow, but it was kind of like convex or concaved in like a weird way, and it was like a brick. It was like a folded and, mat, like like yeah, yeah, skinny bamboo shoots, like like it, like with a twine that like got rolled up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like coughing. And having muscle spasms in my neck, like I'm old or something. I was like, dude, fuck this, man. So that <laughs> was straight up terrible. Last time we were there, we stayed in Ibisu. And that, and I was like complaining about that. Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it had two beds, a workstation, windows, a bat, like um, a shower, you know, a wet room. And then it had a whole separate bathroom. I was complaining about that. Like, this is too small. Nah, man. Like where we were at this time, I would. I'm not complaining anymore if I go back to Ibisu. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. But yeah, that was the, some bullshit, dude. And then the shower. Um, I, me and Ed are really tall. In the shower, I don't know if your shower was like this, Ed, but it was a little like a rowboat, like a little. It was like you could stand up in it, but it was just like a little bigger than, like you know few feet yeah and that thing was trash yeah. but overall but that's why but the the good thing about it is that like you won't stay in your hotel long you're going to go out that's a, that's because that's a thought a you know like 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 fuck it man get get the get the cheapest room that you could find on expedia or yeah. something because if you're chilling in the room too much like you might be a sucker you're missing out yeah you might be you might be a lame and yeah totally. and uh like that's not why you're in Japan to hang out in a hotel room. We we um to sort of circle everything back. Like we we were trying to. It was an impromptu trip. It was real quick, and you remember the first day when we were actually going to kick it, or maybe it was even that night, the, the like the night that you landed, and mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, man, I'll meet you at the in the lobby and shit, and uh, then you're like, yo, dude, I'm in the lobby, and so, I'm like. Yeah. I'm like, right. oh no, nah. you like oh no, like like we got a complication because we were definitely in a lobby and you said you were in right. the lobby and then uh we realized that the hotel you were at was the same brand and it was mm -hmm. th like just 500 couple... feet over there. Like right, like I was going right. to say blocks, but it would be like we're a at an alley. An yeah, we're at an alley. And then there's like a little small, because it's not a grid like New York where a block is a right. square. It's like wedges. And we right. were at the, the tip of like three wedges. 
and it would be three of those Appa hotels. And it was three. Like, like we, mm-hmm. I had to skip the middle Appa hotel, and then right. you're the other Appa hotel that's, like, right on right. the other side of that Appa hotel, which is two away from, right. my, like, my Appa hotel. Right. And uh, But, you know, we figured all that shit out. Yeah, it was all good at the end of the day. It was one of those things, though, where it was, like, kind of funny, though, because we thought our hotel had the same amenities. Yeah. Because I was, like, because it said that in the itinerary. It's like, oh, yeah, like, you know, hot tub, sauna, and all this. And, dude, I get there, and I go down and ask them. They're like, no, we don't have that here. I'm like, man, I got, like, the ghetto off of them. <laughs> <laughs> Man, like I, I put I put real use to that. And and uh any any of the uh like I go back and my joint has saunas, like I'm absolutely t- taking them up on like the the onsen like bathhouse shits cuz I mm-hmm. that stuff, you know, when you land when you land you're fucked already. Like because you're spun around and shit and and you've been traveling for so long and stuff. So you wake up the next morning at like 4 a.m. or something, really. And you, and you feel just fine and ready to go. You know, we ain't even talk about that breakfast that had like the 18 dishes, you know. Right. That, yeah, that, that, we, was, that, we, that, that we got like hard. super, super early. But mm-hmm. um, what I discovered, because like I was perpetually exhausted, you mm-hmm. know, because we were just going hard as fuck. You know, right. like you walk around bow-legged like a cowboy and shit because – we're cartoonists and we fucking sit around drawing all day. So right. like, but now we're clocking 20 miles a day on feet <laughs> on foot. Right. And, uh, I discovered that like that, sh- that shower house, that like bath house or whatever, like that was like my, um, my recharger dude. Yeah. That's your, um, your dark night returns baptism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause like go out shopping a bunch when you start to hit that wall and you got the bags, yeah, like go drop the fucking bags off, go throw on your your um, go grab your 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 bag full of uh, your gray Appa Hotel kimono and shit, right, and and, and your bath towel, <laughs> and then you just go to the to the um spa, strip your ass down butt naked, go take a shower real quick, get all the de- days garbage off of you yeah and then hit that fucking hot bath dude and you feel it directly in your ankles and shit to start where you like it just is like massaging your ankles dude and breathing that nice hot air and then uh you're done with that man you take another shower get get all the fucking juices from the onsen off off of you Mm -hmm. off of you then it's dinner time man get fresh smell nice Go out with the fam, mm-hmm. and and you know go get some crazy dinners. Hell yeah! Chill out yeah, a little was bit incredible. at night and fucking wash, rinse, repeat the next day. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things that we're like, um, it's a system. It's it's interesting because when over there, everything makes sense, like the systems. You know what I mean? And so even like at the last hotel, they have like bath salts. Oh yeah. So it's like so the idea of like soaking and relaxing is like a big component to it in the sense of like your daily activity. So it's one of those things that I actually integrated that back home yeah. here, um, yeah. back in Columbus. It makes sense now. Totally. All that stuff, man. Like, like the first, the first time I came back the first time, man, on day one, uh, grab, bought one of them Japanese robot toilets. Hell yeah, dude. Yeah. You know, I would you told me you did that. I was like, Oh, you can do that? That makes sense now. Like You know what I did too, man? It was funny because like you just see the same name pop up on all them shits. Toto. <laughs> right? You see the Toto. So I like went on the Toto website. I was like, I want me one of those shits, man. Right, I'm in, I'm right. in love. I'm in love now, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, because before you have one, you don't think of it. But afterwards, you're like, man, it feels kind of barbaric using toilet paper. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it actually is like, uh, a world of difference it's a quality of life oh yeah totally man and, and it was definitely flexing during covid and shit Hell yeah. when, when everybody was like trying to punch each other in the mouth for some rolls like fucking fist of the north star and shit and i'm just i just remember taking a picture of my little the little uh remote right like fuck you fuck you all in your toilet vapor 
But, no, but then after that last time, man, because you evangelized me on the bath salts that last time, and I'm like, right. and like while we were out there, I'm like, right. I think tonight's a blue night. I'm gonna get me the blue bath salts with yeah, the with the, with, with, with the moon on it. Yeah, yeah, it's the expression. Yeah, you're like all this type of mood I'm in. Yeah, so yeah. like it's it's dope though. Like it's like a nice quality of life. Yeah, it totally. Works. The ablution, man. You do the day's activities and fucking cool out afterwards. The shit. Yeah. Dude. It actually does rejuvenate you. Like you feel like, um, like the muscles and everything relaxing. You're like, oh, this is great. So yeah, it's one of those things where incorporating something like that's just super easy because you can do that here in America. You know what I mean? Super successful manga quest 2023. Oh my gosh, yeah. Part one, Ed. That's it. That's it, man. Uh, I I know that there are plans to get back like November ish. Yeah, November. Amazing. Going for it. Are you going for a month? We'll see. We'll see. We'll yeah. see what happens, man. Like I, like I need to, I need to keep the head down and keep fucking working my my fucking ass off in the same way that I did this past like five months. Mm-hmm. Got to earn totally. it. Got to earn yep. that time down, dude. Especially like I'm, I'm working to be a daily cartoonist now, man. Like, uh, like coming up with a daily strip. And since I've been back, I've been, mm-hmm. uh, it like because of the jet lag and stuff. Like, the readers don't care about your jet lag right they just care about their comic so my head ain't there to like put put the proper pen and ink like final stuff that the that the audience gets to see but Mm -hmm. i can relax and i can compose and i could set up my pages and stuff so that's what i've been doing the past week man is just is doing my roughs and and setting the stuff up and basically you just got to print it out blue and uh you get to get the ink in each day so yeah gotta gotta earn it gotta keep my head down gotta keep working every day and uh in order to to make to make that shit happen but the fact that you're going out like you know fomo is real man like (laughs) i'm gonna have to go out for at least a portion right exactly yeah it's one of those things where like um when i got back i started scanning in all the um the zips you know the deleters yeah so doing that i haven't archived any of the books yet um started working on Finishing up a few comics um, that will be going into print uh, next month, hopefully. Um, and then, like you said, just earning that keep. You know what I mean? So yeah. the goals for the next jobs and then make the comics. The comics pay for us to get out there. So That's it, man. You uh, And you, you acquired some cool cool gigs while, while we were out there, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, uh, we could talk about that for a moment. If that's cool. Um, so <clears throat> I got hit up by um, Harper Collins to work on a third volume. I won't announce the book yet, just because I haven't got it. Yeah, yeah, just but, let it, just let it be, and and, and we and we, we yeah. can cir- we can circle back with that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So you know, we'll say it's four hundred pages. Jesus. And they need it. They need it the year. Jesus. <laughs> so, so I feel like the we'll Eightfold Path team is gonna be fucking. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have to bring back the team, wipe off the dust from Eightfold Path. Man. <laughs> yeah, so we'll see what happens. But, yeah, once we figure that out, I'll come back and we can talk about it. Yeah, totally. And and uh, I implore you uh, at some point, man, when you got some real big willy shit that you need to uh, to promote, man, like make the little trip to Pittsburgh. Hell yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah I've been stacking. Yeah. I got some surprises for the crew, for the kayfabers. Um but you know, I'll save it for the trip we make out there. It's some good shit. Yeah, 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 dude. It's endless. Like, like your your collection is endless, man. Uh, it's it's yeah. unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> it was such a pleasure being out there with you, um, with that set of eyeballs that you possess, uh, and sort of that keen awareness of like, what is this, man? They, you know, it's that it's that curiosity. Like almost yeah. everybody we were with. You know, cause like, cause like we're the core. You like, I mean, let's be honest. Like, like you and me, yeah, we're, yeah. we're doing our yeah. thing, man. We we known each other for a decade, right? And so like, it's the nucleus, and yeah, yeah. we're off like little boys and shit, like like pulling stuff off, checking it out, and everybody says the same stuff. Like, you can't even read the spines, man. But how do you know what you're even looking at? And it's like, hey, bro, if, if you don't know, you don't know. Answer. Yeah, exactly. I think the biggest one, um, and I don't have it on camera here, but um we spoke about it slightly and was the um the popeye issue that you got me hip to you got it yeah it was crazy so what happened crew was that we're at the Madarake, 
and I see these issues of Popeye, which isn't uncommon. It's a popular but, magazine to this day yeah. out there. Mm-hmm. And you'll see it. You'll see cool covers and all that kind of stuff. But there's one specific issue. It's the American issue. And Ed's already documented this on the Kayfabe channel. It blew my fucking mind. Um, Otomo did an illustration of Black Panther. Um, and there was other artists in there too, like Fist of North Star, um, a few other ones. They like did different characters. But we know why we're here. It was the Otomo Black Panther. Yeah, there's a lot it's of a- good stuff in that, man. There, there's that. Yeah, like, the, the cosplay. The, the cosplay, amazing. Like It's like famous wrestlers and shit, like dressed yeah. up like Captain America. Um, Ryo Ichi Ikigami, dude who drew Crying Freeman, is the dude who d- does that Captain America drawing. Yeah, which that one, that's the, per- it's funny that they um, put that as the premiere, you know what I mean? And it's like dope, you know what I mean? Because it's interesting. But I'm like, yeah, we got to turn the page to make sure that Otomo Black Panther's in there. Yeah. So when, what happened was that I'm like, okay, here's some issues of Popeye on the shelf. And it's, this is a dollar shelf. It's a clearance shelf. The first thing I pull out is that American issue. And I said, man, I'm really good at this. Yes, sir, <laughs> man. That's, that's, a, that's amazing. That's amazing, man. Because cause it, it, it illustrates a lot. Like, it's like you got that, that awareness to dig. But mm. any schmo, man, would pass that up. Like, who cares about right. a, a color pencil drawing of Mick Jagger? You right. Know, like, why, no, like, no. like, why would I open that? You know? Right. It's like, no, you better open it, man. That's the one. Yeah, exactly. Good stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's those kind of things where, like, if you develop an eye for it, you can really, like, key in. A lot of it's listening and, like, seeing and, like, just paying attention to, like, stuff that, like, people don't even think about. You know, there's always something interesting because, like, I end up in print um, just as myself and, like, random things so and if i like think my shit's cool then there must be other cool shit in these like random publications so it's like why not look through them you know what i mean ed so it's just being inquisitive totally man brian moss thank you so much for joining the cartoonist you, Fabe channel the book that he has out right now self-published is mm-hmm. outer heaven number one uh Go to B Moss, man, and scoop this thing up. We got uh, Instagram, Strange Things Moss, Brian Christopher Moss, Facebook, email, Strange Things Moss at gmail.com. Yes, sir. B Moss, what else is going on right now that we got to push out to the people? So I'm working on um, a manga from our first trip. Um, one more page left, so I'm printing that next month. And what does that and- mean, man? Is it an autobiography? Oh, is yeah. It- no, so what it is, it's almost kind of like documenting. So I took photographs while I was there. So it's documenting a lot of that through story. So I create a, a female character. She's a goddess. And then she goes on a, um, a bender where she wants to go kill her father. So it's actually an awesome story. But I use the environment of all the places that Ed and I visit on my first trip to tell the story. So that's why I consider it a manga. And so it's kind of done in the same style, black and white. Um, I used all the material that I got from Japan. So it's just me fully immersed into the Japanese culture and things I've learned um, expressed through a comic. So, yeah. So that will be next month. And I think I'm going to call it juicy because that word keeps coming up on our trips. (laughs) (laughs) And then um, the other book I'm working on is just a collection of um, illustrations that include character designs, some mini comics. Um, I'm going to publish that in July. So both those will pop up on my um, Instagram or on my Etsy page. Excellent, Excellent, man. And let's get you into the uh, Kayfabe studio sooner than later. Want everybody everybody to know about the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus coming out uh, during the holidays. 504 pages or so, 140 pages plus of material that is not in those first four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree. Drew a bunch of new shit. That is going into this big book, man. This is going to be the ultimate statement. Red Room has started up again. There are two trade paperbacks of Red Room out there today. And uh, we're starting out the issues again. Crypto Killers is the new season of Red Room Comics. This is the cover to issue number one. Got various flavors on that. Sketch cover. I did a variant. Jimmy did it. Jim Rugg did a variant. Peach and Momoko did a variant for that. Here's a copy of uh, what the 
cover for issue number two is going to look like. Got some other big announcements uh, forthcoming, but I'll do uh, independent videos on that stuff. Uh, Brian, man, I don't know if you watch enough uh, if you watch enough cartoonist kayfabe videos, man, uh, to in order to give these people the marching orders. Someone put you on the spot. Oh. And I think it is read more comics. There it is, <laughs> man. Thanks so much, B. Thank you. Take